Hardee's or Arby's? Arby's was good mood food. That terrible slogan. Are you ready for some football? That's a thing. No, that's different. Are yeah. you ready for some good food? Is that what you said? Some real food. Are you ready for some real food? I think it's Hardee's. Are you ready for some real food? Hardee's. Hardee's, 92. Okay. All right. Look at that. Going way back. That, that was, those are the California Raisin days. It was. Yeah. Yeah. That was before the oven mitt showed up. They had an oven mitt mascot for a little oh, while. Oh, for Hardee's? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Or no. Carl's Jr., depending on where you are in the country. Yeah, I don't know if they shared mascots through their timeline or not, but... I don't know. Yeah, I'm, we're, we're ignorant to Carl and his junior. Yep. All right. All right. Ready to do this? Uh, yes. Welcome, everybody, to episode number 127 of the Goulet Pen Cast, where fountain pens are still a thing. I'm Brian Goulet. <laughs> and I'm Drew Brown. And I'm scared. Uh, where fountain pens are still a thing. Oh, wait, I already said that. Jeez. See? I don't have this memorized. Still, 127 episodes in. Um, let's see here. We're going to deliver this casual and informal, tangential and extraneous, superfluous and extemporaneous fountain pen show, where we talk about what's going on at the Goulet Pen Company and in our fountain pen lives. I just can't look at Drew while I do this because it just distracts me too much. Uh, in today's show, we're going to talk about if we should make fountain pens a requirement. That's even more distracting. <laughs> we make fountain pens a requirement. Sorry. In today's show, we're going to talk about if we should make fountain... We're off to a strong start here today. Um, if we should make fountain pens a requirement in U.S. schools, uh, gray ink recommendations, pens that we're surprised that we've ended up using as much as we have. We will do apparently a March Madness style bracket of pens that Drew has organized and I have not seen at all. So he's going to attack me with that. And uh, we're going to do a pen spotlight on the Monteverde Ritma Gala, a lanyard pen of all pens. That's right the second, technically third one that we have in our offering. But the only one that comes with a lanyard though, so be ready for that. Uh, well, let's kick off the episode with some feedback. All right. Little Dog's household staff mm -hmm. is kicking things off with us okay. today. Very specific handle. That's right. They know where they fall in the pecking order. Mm -hmm. Drew, how do you feel about Robert Auster Honeybee? for a buttered popcorn substitute. Ooh. Also, I bought a Kakuno after hearing you talk about it so much and I love it. I hope you have a great birthday. Mm. Thank you. I'm planning on it. By the time you hear this, I will have had a great birthday. Mm. Um, Robert Auster Honeybee is not a good substitute for butter yeah. popcorn. Butter popcorn is straight up yellow. Honeybee mm. is like a, a light brown almost. Okay. Um, not yeah. quite a sepia, but definitely not yellow. Yeah. You, you want a yellow more like, a, more like a burnt popcorn yes 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 a burnt burnt mm. popcorn um so no no unfortunately not i think that you'd probably want to go with something more like uh roaring cleaner um uh, uh uh what's that yellow one helianthus helianthus yeah that's a pretty good one why do i know um, that because it's <laughs> why do i remember that color i don't know it's I the should. only yellow they have i think yeah it is uh, but that's a pretty good one. Still not a dead ringer for butter popcorn. Butter popcorn's a little more orangey, mm. uh, which why I like it. It just is a little bit more legible. But uh, yeah, there just will never be another butter just popcorn. A, a so we're just going to pour one out and mm. pretend it's still with us. Um, Jason, uh, Jason <laughs> is saying, I saw a video that pointed out that Eeyore, because we were talking about why some Winnie the Pooh characters get names and some don't. Okay. Um, Eeyore is a name invented by a kid with a non-rotic literally the non-R-like British accent, so that Eeyore would be pronounced very much like a donkey's sound, and an American version would be hee-haw. So what Jason is saying here, that Eeyore's oh. name is basically like Eeyore, like Eeyore without the R, so Eeyore. So it keeps on trend with the very simplistic naming yeah. to the animal. So Eeyore, according to Jason, is essentially British hee-haw. Okay. Okay. So Winnie the we'll Pooh is the only one who's not named yeah. after we, the there, animal, we, there, there's If you want more education about Winnie the Pooh naming conventions, there are more in last week's comment section. Um, not I surprisingly. Thought, I thought you were going to say there are other videos that people make that educate you more. Probably. We're maybe Probably. not the best reference for it. No, no, no. no. We, we, were just, we were just confused by it. But there you go. Jason at least knows more than we, um, which isn't saying a whole lot because we knew nothing about it. All right. Gummy Bear 1972 says, Drew, I also feel like I need to play with my pens <clears> equally. And I get the same reaction Brian gave you. They don't have feelings. They don't. 
Yes, I know, but it feels wrong for me to keep favoring some over others. Part of it is giving each pen a fair chance at being evaluated by me. Thank you. I know okay. that I'm in good company okay. because there were plenty of people, Brian, I have no doubt. who not only felt very no emotionally doubt. and, you know, they would personify, <laughs> characterize their pens yes. and also specifically said that they felt the same way I did about my stuffed animals when I was a kid, mm. about giving them fair share of cuddle time in the bed and felt bad for the ones that were being neglected down by the feet. So, um, yeah. yeah, one time I felt so bad because I had a Teddy Ruxpin as many um, children of the 80s did. Uh-huh. Uh, and I was, yeah, I, he was not a cuddly bear, but Teddy Ruxpin's a piece of equipment. Yeah. Um, but still, I was, I was very happy. I, I wanted him for a long time. So had him, uh, his eyes opened and closed. So I was like, it, it was, yeah. I was in bed one night just kind of playing with his eye, making it go open and close, uh-huh. and it just fell back into his head. <gasps> so he was just staring at me with a dark cavern in one of his eyes. <laughs> Oh my and I felt so bad that I injured him in this way wow. that I continued to sleep with him out of sadness and pity oh because I did not want him to be relegated to like the island of misfit toys just because I, you know, mm. poked his eye out. But so that meant I slept with a, you know, kind of creepy looking. I mean, he's already a robotic bear, but all, yeah. like now he's a one eyed robotic bear that looks that he's looking at me and he knows what I did to him. So when you use him after that, did his eyelids still go up and down? But One of them just did. But it like a black hole. One of them did, yeah. That's oh, what's yeah. terrifying. <laughs> yeah, so so that's, that's the downside of being like really empathetic is that, you know, mm. you feel bad enough to sleep with a creepy one-eyed bear because you know you, you're responsible for that and yeah. uh, you want to love him regardless, but it's also traumatic mm. for you. Uh, yeah, young Brian would have wanted to open that bear up and see if I could find out how his eye works. <laughs> I would have torn him apart. I never had a Teddy Ruxpin, though. But they were ex- I, that was another reason I kept it was because I knew it was expensive. Yeah, they were um, expensive at the time. I believe so. My mom told me it was anyway. I don't know. I'm sure it was. But uh, I was like, well, I'm going to continue to play with it. It was, it, like, the hot, not, it was like the hot toy. Oh, I wanted it so some bad. Some 90s yeah. year. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Wow. That's it for me. Just to be clear, my pointing that out was not a criticism. It was more of a giving you permission to not have to I feel compelled to yes. need to do that unless it brings you happiness. So all you viewers out there as well, if giving equal love to all your pens brings you happiness, by all means. Even if it's through it's fabricated only, guilt of non, whatever works. non-sentient items. Whatever works. We all got different motivations. Um, if I was in that case, I would be perpetually dissatisfied because there's no yeah. way I could give you a love It's to a helpful pens. arbitrary rule. Yeah. There you go. All right. I got uh, a couple of pieces of feedback here from, well, different people. But the first one is from Serendipity. Uh, I personally have always wanted Rachel's explanation of the Sailor Inc. Studios numbering system. If you can get her on for that. And I would love to hear Shannon sing. Well, Shannon can definitely sing. Rachel's also a good singer too, but she doesn't do it professionally. Uh, like Shannon does. So Ink Studio's numbering system, Rachel can explain it well. Um, I can explain the five second version of it. Yeah. Basically, the <coughs> further down you go, the darker it gets more or less, and the further to the right you go, like the higher the number goes, the more saturated the color is. What do you mean when you say down? Down like, sorry, I'm thinking of it in like a matrix. Oh. So like when you go the first number, the higher it gets, the darker the color is, so more or less. Are, are we aligning this matrix like from high number to low number? From like low low in the top left corner. I'm trying to think of like how the camera is going to show it. I don't know. I think it's up here. So like the first cell in the spreadsheet, if you will, one, one, you know, row one, column one. Okay. That would be whatever the lowest number is, 100 and something. Okay. And then, you know, down here in the bottom right is 900 whatever the top number is. And then it's everything is kind of like on a gradient from there on. It's not exact, but that's more or less kind of how it works. I don't know. Clearly, Rachel can explain it better than me. But So is it the higher number, the darker the color? I believe so. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But it has to do with like the first number versus the second two, second and third digit. Like the first one is, I don't, I don't remember. I remember, not, I remember clearly knowing what the first and second digit and then being a little hazy about the third. Maybe it is that way. I don't know. It's been a while since I've had Rachel explain okay. it to me. So, but there is a somewhat of a system to it. Maybe, maybe this question can move into the Q and A section next week. That, that could work. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. Next one. Um, Chris Sullis Studios, the Cheerio story for crying faces emojis. Thank you for making my day, and then a fifth crying face emoji. 
<laughs> You're very welcome. <laughs> that got some pretty welcome. good feedback. I'm People appreciated sure you sharing did. that. Well, you know what? I'm glad. One person, I, was alone, I was alone when it happened, so if I had never said anything about it, no you're not alone never anymore. Know. One person yeah. even said, "Oh, Brian only ate one bowl of Cheerios." <laughs> Technically, yeah, exactly. That's that was my logic. Yeah, I'll have a bowl of Cheerios, <laughs> and then another one of the Honey Nut. Anyway, go back and listen to last week's episode if you haven't heard it. Uh, all right, and then another feedback from Wooby. Brian, you had the cheese bread or the crispy polenta. My bet is on the polenta. Glad you had a great time. This was at Fogo de Chao, the the fried cheese or whatever it was, the baked cheese. It wasn't the polenta. I had the polenta. That was also really good. Oh, okay. So but you it had was both. the other one. I had both. Okay. Yeah. It wasn't cheese bread. Oh. It wasn't bread. It was like a solid lump of cheese. Mm. So I don't know. It wasn't very bread-like. They were really small. They were like little squares like this. Hmm. And yeah. Like cubes? Uh, it wasn't really a cube. Brick. It was like, it was like a, yeah, like a brick. Okay. Che- like a Fried cheese brick. Cheese brick. Yeah. That sounds it amazing. It was like square, but it was not as tall as it was around. So mm. it wasn't cubic. It would be like if you cut a cube in half like that. That's the general shape, but it was kind of rounded too. I don't know. I didn't take a picture of it, oh, but shame. I know I missed an opportunity, but anyway, there you go. But the polenta was also really good. Um, Last one, Spider Wrangler 4457. Brian K has Franken pens. Brian G has Franken meals. Yes, indeed. We were talking about your bowls last week. I had a Franken meal today. I had Did you really? Half Chipotle leftovers with a blueberry yogurt and a slice of pie that I never got to. Not in the same bowl, though. Not in the same bowl. Okay, thank God. No, because that would be oh. weird. That's mi- no. That, I mean, you that mixed would be together weird. some. Yeah, but they got to be compatible. Okay. You no, know? I don't. Yeah. Yeah. That's a weird mixture. I would be very upset if you had put blueberry yogurt on top of Chipotle. That's something my daughter would do. No. Oh, 100%. She blueberry yogurt weirdest, on top of Chipotle? She does the weirdest stuff and then claims that it's always good. Like what? Give me one example. Last night, she <laughs> wanted a float, like a root beer float, but we yeah. didn't have a root beer. Um, so she made it with orange juice. So she made an orange juice float. So like orange juice with ice cream in it. That's not the weirdest thing. That no. was like, okay, kind of like an orange I can imagine like Yeah, I can sorts. imagine like an orange soda. Sure. It's hard yeah. for me to imagine orange she juice. She was originally going to use LaCroix, and I was like, that's not going to be good. It's just water. Yes. You're just going to water down your ice cream. Yeah. It's not going to be good. And so Ooh. she relented and did the, the orange juice and then claimed it was great. <laughs> Everything okay. she, she'll, she'll make the weirdest stuff. She mixes wow. all kinds of crazy okay. things well, together. Update us next time it happens. Make a note of it. Okay, I'll try to make a note. I'm yeah. trying to think of like specific things, but at this point, this is so normalized that nothing shocks me anymore. That's fine. Um, but next thing I come up with, I'll, I'll let you know. Yeah, that's good stuff. All right, cool. Um, well, that's what we got for feedback this week. Uh, let's talk about new stuff. Some new stuff. We have a bunch of stuff on the horizon. A bunch. So we're going to just mention a couple of things here today, but be on the lookout for coming soon and new arrivals over the next several weeks. We are going to have a lot. We have a lot in our little uh, project management software that has launch dates with question marks by it because we're waiting for yeah. our photographer. A lot to get of the back stuff and... this week actually has question marks by it. So, yes. but we have all of these on the website. It's all at coming. Least. Yeah, we just don't know the exact yeah. day. Yeah. So anyway, keep checking back regularly. March is going to be a busy month for product launches at Goulet Pens. Uh, first one we have is Diplomat Arrow. This is a new color. This is Midnight Blue. Uh, this is a slightly different one. So if you recall, they did a white version, like a pearlescent white, that was not anodized, but it was lacquered. So it doesn't have a matte finish. It's a little bit of a glossier finish. So it's like a coating on top of the pen, sort of like you have you know, a Pilot Vanishing Point. or It's like the difference between the Lamy when they do the um, studios. Sometimes they're like the matte finish. Sometimes they're more of a glossy finish. The glossy is the lacquered version. It's kind of like that. Um, so this one, Midnight Blue, Steel Nib, $188. Arrow's a great pen. Cap seals amazingly. So you can check that out if you're interested. And then we have a Sailor Pro Gear Slim and Pro Gear Fountain Pen, full size, mid-size. Sorry, I guess I guess it's full size. It's, it's three both. sizes. No, it's just the Well, two. I think a full size is being like king of pens. Yeah, so yeah, That's yeah. as full as you can get. Yeah. Mid-size, I guess, would uh, be the Pro Gear. Uh, it's Iris Nebula. So this is a limited edition. It's 236 and 360, respectively. And uh, they're pretty rad-looking pens. So if you're into Sailor Pro Gears, you know those pens well. So check those out. That's, what I, that's all I got today. 
Yeah, um, not a whole lot more. I will say that um, as I'm holding my own Visconti Mirage Mythos, I'm glad to announce that they're adding another Mythos to the Mirage mm-hmm. line here um, in Poseidon. So they've all been named after Greek deities. Um, and Poseidon is a dark, steely blue, kind of mixed in with some dark grays as well. It's a lovely, lovely color. However, it's different from the other Mirage Mythoses because rather than this kind of um, uh, satin gold, they're opting for a gunmetalish hardware with a ruthenium, very, very black nib mm-hmm. to kind of uh, give it, uh, you know, set itself apart a little bit. So it's a very, very cool pen. It does have a steel nib, but I tell you, it writes marvelously. This pen writes so reliably for me. I can't say enough good things about it. So I'm happy that they're continuing to add these because I think it's a really strong set for Visconti. These are going to come in at 159.20. So a great price for a Visconti that actually does feel like a premium writing instrument, which is another reason I really love the Mythos Mirage, Mirage Mythos. Mm-hmm. Um, also coming down the pipeline is this. This is what a is new that? rickshaw pen case, and this is an exclusive to the Goulet Pen Company. It is a triple XL pen sleeve from rickshaw with red stitching, black cloth, and then a red um, royal plush interior mm. to house your E95S. It would definitely house probably a few of them. <laughs> no, it is made to house <laughs> your big pens, your Namiki Emperors, your Magna Carta Mag 1000s, your Pelican M 1000s. If you have a big oversized pen, this is going to be able to keep it safe, secure. So um, these are going to be available uh, this week at $24. And um, yeah, we opted for a black and red because we thought it felt it kind of cool. had that kind of Urushi vibe. So yeah. um, there we go. We thought it would be helpful for those of you who have a monster, beautiful pen and you know, want it nestled in a little cozy home. Awesome. So there you go. You can get it at the Goulet Pen Company. Cool. And that's it for new stuff. Awesome. Um, I would move on to company updates. We don't really have any, so we're just going to kind of skip right over. We got a new video coming out this week. That's true. Let's do that then. Um, you have a video, Drew, on Ben New. I do. It's gonna been. It's gonna. It's, it's gonna, gonna have been new this it will, it week. It is. It is Ben New this week. Ah, Ben New. Ben New. Yeah, it was fun cool. to put together. It, was, yeah. it allowed me an opportunity to go into their website and really kind of dig in. I mm-hmm. knew what I thought was a lot, but then I learned more, and it was a, a lot fascinating journey, and I'm really yeah. excited to take everybody along with me there. That's right. There you go. Yeah. Um, that's really about all we have going on at the moment. It so is. So we'll get right into the Q&A. All right. Yes. We're going to uh, have a truncated Q&A today because uh, question four is a little bit of a chonker. Mm. Um, but... Uh, for now, we're going to kick things off with... Uh, you think it's going to be truncated? Yeah, we'll see. I might. We'll see. Untruncate it. Oh, gosh. Um, Josh Reese, 85, says, European countries seem to be more fountain pen friendly and actually incorporate fountain pens into early childhood education. Mm. Do you feel the United States should do something similar? And what pen would you encourage a young student to start with and why? Mm. Thank you, Brian and Drew. I think it's Joshua Rice now that I'm looking at the name. <gasps> Joshua, Joshua Reese. Joshua oh Reese. my gosh. Joshua Rice, yeah. Joshua Rice. I could yes. be wrong. I could be wrong. No, that's <laughs> Joshua Reese. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. I'm as old as all time. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the US used to have it more common with fountain pens in school. Uh, but I don't know if it was ever required broadly. I'm sure individual schools required it. I know talking to my parents, they said that it was required for them. Um, but I don't know that it was ever like a universal thing across the whole country. Um, it, I think it was probably for some schools, you know, maybe even still today, but it's probably culturally, it's pro- we're probably about two generations past the point where that would have even been realistically a thing in the U.S. Uh, of course, I'd be all into it because I love fountain pens and I think they're amazing uh, in all practicality. I would say it's probably not likely to happen in the U.S. without something minorly and maybe not so minorly miraculous to happen because I think we got some bigger fish to fry as a governmental body. Um, And I also would kind of associate it more with cursive writing as well. So cursive was dropped from the national requirements for the Department of Education in 2010, 2011, somewhere around there. Uh, So we're a decade and almost a half past that. But I think a lot of states are bringing it back, but it's still not required nationally. So to me, it would seem kind of ridiculous. Oh, hey, 
we got lights on back there. Uh, to me, it would seem kind of unrealistic to require a fountain pen without having it associated with cursive, though it doesn't necessarily have to be. People can enjoy fountain pens without cursive writing, but I do believe that is commonly the um, tie that binds, uh, at least with other countries. You know, I'm thinking like Italy, um, Japan, Germany, France, where fountain pen in schools is much more common, if not required. Um, I think that's because it's associated with cursive writing and penmanship and stuff like that. Um, so I would think that the two would need to be kind of tied together. So I'm not going to say they could never happen, but it's not very likely. Um, of course, I would be all for it. But uh, one thing that might be kind of hard is to actually get that many pens. Um, cause I would think not that it's a requirement, but I would think that probably each country would want to use pens that are made in that country for their kids in school. I know that's the case with Germany for sure. Um, you know, that's where like Lamy and Pelican and, you know, other brands like that, Rotring and stuff. I didn't um, think about that. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's part of why like Pelican and Lamy, why they have pens you're like, these look weird. What are these going? Yeah. It's because they're like nobody would want these. Pens. Well, yeah, they're not for you. Yeah, exactly. So there is no U.S. manufacturer of fountain pens that could even come close to supplying the U.S. school system with fountain pens. Even just looking at the rough numbers, the estimates for third graders in the U.S., which I just use third graders because that's when I learned cursive and you learned cursive like eons ago. Um, there's four million third graders in the US approximately. Okay. So as a base estimate, you would need 4 million pens, but probably a lot more because kids lose and break pens. So I can't think of any US manufacturer of pens that would be able to even approach that number, no. um, let alone something economical. Um, so it would have to either be foreign made or I'm sure if there was a decree from the government that every kid had to use a fountain pen, somebody, some entrepreneurial person would pop up and start making those pens. Um, in fact, you know, I'll raise my hand and say, if that ever happens, I'll throw my hat in the ring and we'll figure something out. Um, but, you know, I'm not gonna yeah. lose any sleep over that. I do think that um, there are, you know, other European countries that, uh, other than Germany, that do use Lamy's in school. I don't think it's just a German yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, probably but, not. But yeah. I would I think the Lamy ABC has overflowed into other neighboring countries. I'm sure, I'm sure. Yeah, but I would say like any, any major country, any producing country would be inclined to use, especially if it was like coming from the government. Yeah. It's especially overseas required. would be a much bigger challenge. <clears throat> shipping yeah. millions of pen overseas is... I mean, it can happen. Might as well take that shipping money and start I mean, your own factory. Look at how many ballpoints and rollerballs are shipped overseas yeah. every day. So yeah. it definitely happens. But, you know, I don't know. That'd be really interesting. It'd be a great problem to have uh, if that was the case. But when I think about my um, daughter, I talked about this a few weeks ago, but my daughter's math class, the teacher, you know, had a contest for the kids to bring in pencils because they had already gone through a thousand pencils just as that one class over the first, whatever, five months of that year. So when I think about like how many fountain pens kids would probably go through and lose and all that kind of stuff, I'm like, that's a lot of pens. So I don't no, know. We got some comments about that. There were some people that were pretty stunned about like, where are they going? I was stunned. Like, yeah. Physically, where, where do they end up? It's a great question. Like, I don't know. If they don't come back home, then where in the school are they? It's like, a good question. It's a mystery. Yeah. I don't know. Are they throwing them out? Are they, you know, it's not like my daughter's pulling out like handfuls of pencils every day. But then again, we do have a lot of pencils that just float around our house. I don't know where most of them came from. So I don't really know. Um, I agree with you wholeheartedly. I, there's zero chance that all of a sudden the U.S. is going to say, you know what's important now? Fountain pens and cursive. <laughs> you know, it's not going to happen. Forget AI. Forget, yeah, you know, no, that's that not going to happen. However, I do think that fountain pens and cursive should find their way back into schools. Now, that might sound contradictory to what I just said. Somewhat but of a hot take. I think that not in this they community, should find... It's a hot take. Yeah, I think they should find their way into schools through an art class option rather than mm. a requirement. I think mm. that if, I think art is such a common class for most everybody from, you know, elementary mm -hmm. school through all of middle school, it becomes an elective at some point, but also for at some point, it's just something you do. And not everybody is a super creative person in mm -hmm. terms of kind of just your more baseline art projects. And I think that cursive writing 
is so accessible to folks without, you know, kind of that kind of classic, you know, physical media creativity, because mm -hmm. it's already connected to you in terms of, well, I can write, so just write differently. And I think that mm -hmm. it's, if they would choose that, I think a lot of kids would find that the process of writing in cursive, using a fountain pen is just as gratifying as using a watercolor paintbrush and, you know, doodling something on a piece of paper, if not mm -hmm. more gratifying. But then yeah. I think it would still kind of exercise that part of the student's brain and potentially give them something that they're even more proud of. If they are not a watercolor and paintbrush type person, which we all have to go through the watercolor and paintbrush phase of school, like put they put those in your hands at some point regardless. Mm -hmm. If you wanted to opt for a pen and ink instead and learn a little bit of cursive, I think the kids are going to know, like, this sounds more appealing to me. Give them that option. Mm -hmm. And then even further into high school, make it an option to, you know, get into even further in, in the goal of having it be both an artistic endeavor and a meditative slash, you know, relaxation endeavor, you mm -hmm. know, a mental health endeavor. So I do think that pens, ink, cursive can be in schools. I just think that they would need to take a different form, you know, mm -hmm. either a more, um, you know, mental form or a artistic form. But I definitely mm -hmm. still think there's room for them because yeah. I found, I find that writing with them is, it does kind of scratch that same creative creativity itch that doodling or drawing mm. does. But I feel like my end result is just something I can do something with mm. rather than just a little doodle of a dude that I ball up and throw away. You know, I can yeah. actually write a letter, but be intentional in the same way and actually have it mean something to somebody else. Because you can always yeah. give a letter to somebody, but if you just doodle a character, it's fun while you're doing it, but then you got nothing to do for it. Mm -hmm. You can't just give it to somebody and be like, hey, look what I did for you. And they're like, oh, okay. But words mm -hmm. with a flair of your own personality imbued into them do have meaning and can kind of be given. And I think it's more meaningful. So I think I think it could happen. It just needs to, hmm. it needs to transform a little bit. That is an interesting proposition because I think obviously part of the argument around cursive in schools is like baked in as a part of the curriculum, everyone's required to do it, which means like part of your English or literature or whatever means doing that, which makes sense because it's, it's all words. Yeah. But that's an interesting prospect of having it be more of an artistic kind of a thing. So yeah, I'm very curious about that. And I'd love to hear in the comments too, you know, obviously we have a pretty international audience here. It's always really interesting to hear what uh, you all, what your experience has been growing up, and then also what are schools kind of currently requiring in your area? Um, because, you know, it's the kind of thing that like, you know, there is some centralization, at least in the US, around what's taught in a curriculum, but it's also quite decentralized. It's very much up to the states and even individual school districts, you know, in counties or townships or whatever, um, about how they teach stuff. So there's, there's a lot of room for kind of like grassroots, um, you know, um, efforts to influence some of the stuff that's in the curriculum. So um, it's definitely the kind of thing like, you know, individual schools, especially like charter schools, private schools, all that, where cursive is required and it's taught and stuff like that. So um, very curious to hear any of y'all's experiences on it. But yeah, as a whole, I mean, I think it would be great. But do rather you your know. kids know cursive? Um, it's weird because they were around that age when COVID hit and they were doing virtual schooling. So Joseph missed out on it completely. Ellie naturally was much more interested in wanting to do cursive. So she did some, but she's got kind of her own flair to it. Mm. She's not one much for conformity of any type. So she, even with her uh, dad's patience instruction, uh, was one to take and leave her own desired uh, aspects of cursive writing. So I was like, look, I'm just going to try to make it fun for her. I'm not going to you know, smack her knuckles with a ruler or anything to make her write words a certain way. But she's definitely more expressive in her writing. Joseph is more expressive in his Lego building and coding probably. So yeah, you know, each kid's different, Yep. but I like the option. So that's kind of cool. Yeah. But it's definitely worth keeping in the conversation. All right, Drew, I got a question for you. Okay. John Sebastian Turgeon says, I just recently got into gray inks. Any recommendations? John, I don't have a ton Jean, of- Jean, probably Jean, Jean Sebastian. Oh, I see. That Jean, sounds like Jean French, Sebastian. Sorry, I didn't, French name. I heard it, didn't read it. Yeah. Um, Jean, Jean. Uh, I have a very strong feeling 
for gray inks in general, but I don't have a ton of really strong recommendations. But I wanted to make sure we cover this because we don't talk about gray mm -hmm. inks enough. And I think gray inks yeah. are fantastic. They're easy to overlook. They are, yeah. they are, but they really are fantastic. And if you have mm -hmm. not tried a gray ink, please just go to the website, sort by gray ink and pick one because you'll be surprised at how much you like it. Um, I certainly was. So I started off writing with Lexington Gray by Noodlers. That was my first gray ink that I got into. It does feather quite a bit though. So I ended up moving on for the, from that onto Diamine Graphite. Um, Diamine Graphite was great. It had a nice, you know, uh, shading aspect to it, a little bit darker, definitely darker than Lexington, um, and had like a hint of green to it, I found. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, it was nice. And then I moved on to Diamine Silver Fox when that came out. It was one of those like yeah. anniversary inks that mm -hmm. came in little wedge bottles. Yeah. And that has been my favorite gray ongoing since then. Mm -hmm. It is lighter. So um, it's lighter than graphite, doesn't do as much um, for shading, but I still think it's plenty visible in an extra fine nib. So Silver Fox is definitely my favorite of the bunch. I've tried several others as well. I've, honestly, most gray inks are great. You, I mean, it's no surprise. The variation there is not high. Like yeah. you could have a hundred different blues and none of them are identical. Can't really do that with grays. Yeah, I mean, some grays lean more green, some lean more blue or purple slightly. Yeah, and some of them yeah. do. Some do kind of blur the line there. And when you, it just seems like when you do go into that that purple, it stops becoming a gray. Like, um, yeah, you know, like Ink Studio One Twenty Three or something like that. Like, yeah, I wouldn't call that a gray. I mean, it's gray. -ish, I know. It's like but... I pulled I pulled up our site because we have filters for all the colors. Yeah, and I was looking at them and I was like. Yeah, when you when you see all the grays, you're like, okay, and then 123, you're like, that's that's blue. That's, yeah, what's that even doing? There? Exactly. And then like Urban Vert Degree, it's like, yeah, that's green. That's not yeah. even gray. So there's like a lot of grayish colors, but compared to the true grays, it, it's almost like if it has like any color to it. You're like, well, that's not a gray. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, I feel the same way. So as far as true grays go, I put Silver Fox at the top graphite down below and then you know i don't know you got uh, lexington's okay it doesn't behave super well and everything it dries really fast if you're into that it's water course, resistant that's yeah really so good. like anything that dries really fast is gonna mm -hmm. be kind of messy on certain types of paper uh mm -hmm. for you see uh, that's a great that's the great right yeah that's a yeah. good one mm -hmm. that's a pretty that's good, good one, one. Uh, i've used that for a long time or yeah. haven't haven't used it for a long time but for a long time i did use it um but i as long as it's a true gray like my point is try a gray just try a true <clears throat> gray because yeah. You can use it anywhere you can use a black. If you're worried about it, you know, standing out or not using anything too audacious, a gray is just as acceptable as a black, uh, but it's just a little bit more fun. If you mm -hmm. are in a situation where you want to just kind of stick with something black, something very kind of general, switch with a gray. It's like black with a little bit more personality. You know, it just yeah. has a little bit more depth because you can, it does allow you to pool the ink in certain places. It looks yeah. like you're writing with a fountain pen, whereas a black, sometimes you could be like, well, what what wrote that? It could, what, yeah. could have been a ballpoint. For some people like, some people are like, shading is like a flaw in yeah, fountain and pens. That's fine. And, it's and like, that's fine. That's the best part. Yeah, so yeah. if you like that, then great. There are options for yeah. you, but uh, we yeah. do have a We do have a gray ink sample set that we package together. So it's five inks. It's Diamine Earl Gray. Oh, that's another fantastic one. Yes. a really good one. Oh, that, one's the, that, that one's one. the darkest of these. Uh, Diamine Ghost. I haven't used that one. I've never used that one. Um, it's a lighter gray. Diamond Graphite, which again, compared to these other ones, looks a little green. Uh, Lexington Gray, and then Fuyus Yogan. So yeah. Looking at knowing that, Fuyus yeah. and Ghost almost look blue. Yeah, they do, but they're, yeah. they're I mean, they're pretty gray. Yeah, you there know? are more blue grays than that. Yes. But yes. What Ghost, I, Ghost almost has a little bit of pink to it even. Yeah, that which must some, have, some grays do. That must have been like a, a, uh, pin, a an ink vent ink or something like that. Yeah, I need to look that up. I'm not sure what um, Ghost One is. other thing I like about gray fountain pen inks is that you can get refills uh, for ballpoints in so many colors, but I have never seen a gray like rollerball refill. Hmm. So to me, gray is a special kind of... Hmm. Uh, rare ink color that maybe not always. I'm sure I'm wrong. I'm sure there's a gray rollerball ink refill out there somewhere. It's a big world, but to me, gray is like kind of fountain pen specific. So I, I don't know. It's kind of I don't know. Feels yeah. like a little exclusive. Yeah, I like it too. I have some similar tastes. I had Diamond Graphite. That's actually probably my favorite of the bunch. I think you told me about Graphite the first. Yeah, time. I remember when Graphite first came yeah. out. This was in like 2010, I think it was, maybe 2011. But um, Graphite's been good. It really looks like you're writing with a Graphite pencil. It does, but it like shades and stuff. It's really cool. Um, I like Noodler's Lexington Gray for anything waterproof. Um, I threw in here Urban Stormy Gray. 
So that's a gray with a bit of a gold shimmer to okay. it, which is kind of cool. It's not an intense gold shimmer. You can get other ones that have more shimmer, but this one is nice because, you know, it's weird having a contrast sometimes with like a really kind of relatively flat, you know, neutral color like mm -hmm. gray, but then you throw a bunch of shimmer or sheen or something like that in there. And it's like, what is happening? Um, but I think stormy gray is a nice balance there. Um, and then diamond moon dust. So that one has silver shimmer in it. So that one's a nice balance too. Um, yeah. Stormy gray is a good shimmers. one. I remember when that one came out too. That was, yeah, that was early one. on in the 1670 series. Yeah. And for a gray ink, that one has remained pretty popular. Yeah. So, um, and they don't put a ton of shimmer in their inks. Yeah. It used to seem like a lot, but then Robert Oster and Dimine and private reserve, you're like, Oh, this is not that much compared yes. to everybody else. <laughs> mm -hmm. So yeah, those are just some classics. Um, so yeah, the ink sample pack looks pretty good. And then any of the ones we've recommended here. Um, but yeah, grays are fun. They're, they're like a underserved, probably under talked about color in the fountain pen. Absolutely. World. But they can be a lot of fun. hundred percent. Cool. All right. Question number three comes to us from seaweed kisses mm -hmm. and seaweed kisses asks us out of your entire collection, which fountain pens and inks do you find yourself using the most or one that you've surprisingly stuck to the longest, mm. if any. Mm. Brian? I feel like I don't have a very exciting answer here because I talk about yeah. the pens I use quite and a bit. And you know what? That's fine. Obviously, Seaweed Kisses, yeah. you know, uh, maybe might well, be newer or... Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, okay. So probably the one that I didn't anticipate using as much would be the Traveler's Pen um, because I generally don't like smaller, thinner pens. Um, I generally don't lean towards cartridge-only pens. Um, but just something about it. It just makes it a very conveniently packaged pen that I can just throw in my pocket and not really have to think about until I need a pen. Uh, so I would say in terms of words written, that one can't really rightfully fall under my most used pen. However, I've been carrying it on my person longer than almost any other pen that I've had. So I think it's word deserves some kind of recognition definitely. or shout out. I, I think it definitely does because you did not have an immediate like reaction to it and say, oh my God, this is an awesome pen. It became it neat. It became one of your favorites just yeah. by being itself and mm -hmm. being a utility. And I think that earns it a special spot because a lot yeah. of your other pens, like the Lamy 2000, for example, like you were in love with that thing since day one. Like that was a special pen. I did like that one, yeah. So I think this is this is this kind of should earn mm. extra points just because yeah. it, it it really earned it. It didn't start yeah. in the green, you know, it started yeah. neutral. Yeah, or, though, you know, I, I will say like I, I got it because it was interesting and it was yeah. a new brand. And so it was like just kind of needed to know what it was. But pretty quickly, I was just like, oh, this is really easy to just throw in my pocket. And then I just did. And it was like it just never left. Yeah. So that's kind of where that one falls. I think that's awesome. Um, plus, it's like one nib size only. It's such a simple pen. Like there's really just not much to it. But that's also why I like it is because I just don't have to think about it. Um, so that is one that's definitely worth thinking about. Um, the other ones that I have aren't super surprising. I mean, Lamy 2000 is up there. Though I will say when I first got a Lamy 2000, it was neat, but I wasn't like carrying it around using it all the time. Like I went through a few years there where I would use it sort of off and on, but I had other pens I was using. You know, that was that was like one of my first gold new pens. Might have been my second because the Custom 74 was my first. I think the Lamy 2000 might have been next. I'm not 100% sure about that, but um, it was pretty early on back when, you know, I had laundry piled up in the background in my bedroom video days. Um, so yeah, Lamy 2000, definitely have used that one quite a bit. That one I've written with actually a ton. Um, I've also used the Homo sapiens quite a bit as well. Yes, you I was have. Daily carrying that for a while as well. Um, haven't as much recently. Um, Twisby Eco and 580. I'm carrying you know one or both of those around a lot with me. I keep it in my backpack. I use it with my journals and stuff like that. So those I'm using quite a bit regularly. I wouldn't say that's necessarily surprising. Maybe surprising because I like that Prussian Blue 580 ALR. I don't love the texture, but I don't mind it. And I love the color so much. I just use it even though if it had a smooth grip, I would probably actually enjoy it a little bit more, but it doesn't bother me. So I just keep using it. Um, and then inks, I couldn't remember if they asked about inks or maybe, yeah, they did. Pens and inks. Do you find yourself using this? Um, not much of a surprise. I use Robert Oster, Blue Water Ice a ton. In fact, we needed to ink up the Ritma today. And I was like, well, 
what could I use? And I'll just use Blue Water Ice. There you go. So I just went with it. Um, Diamond Red Dragon, I use that one a bunch. It's like my go-to red. Uh, Emerald of Shavor, use that one a lot. Love that color. Kanpeki. I'm kind of boring with inks. The no, ones I, I keep coming back to. I like not, what I like. I don't think it's boring. Like you, they are. It feels trying. boring. Well, it feels boring. Only, but. only to you because you, you've been going for so long. But that's yeah. exactly what Seaweed Kisses is asking. Like, yeah, I those think, are your tried and true. They're ride or dies. Yeah, true. I think part of it is like I'm trying new pens all the time. Mm -hmm. So I, I find that if I'm using a new ink with a new pen, then that's just like additional variables. That's right. So you know, kind of like how you're testing a lot of inks. So you are more inclined to stick with some of the same pens mm -hmm. so that you can test out the inks. I'm kind of the opposite because I got to do all the nib nooks. I'm, I have my own pens that I'm changing out all the time. Um, and so I'm finding myself being less adventurous with ink so that I have fewer variables when I'm assessing pens, if that makes sense. Yeah, it totally does. Yeah. But I do find myself like, oh, I kind of want to use this other color, but I'm like, ah, okay, I'll just use, you do, know, do you have, marine or something, you know. Do you have an Do you have an ink color that you do want, kind of like a, a go to standby, and just haven't found it yet? As far as like a shade of color, yeah. Mm. Like, do you wish you had just like go to purple that you just loved and was consistent, or something like that? It's a good question. I feel like if I wanted that, I would have that by now. It's not that I like haven't been able to find one. You I, know I, what I mean, yeah, for me, I I, I do is I have, I still don't have a favorite brown. Like really, I have Diamond Winter Spice mm. is currently my favorite brown, yeah. but it's not just a brown. It's got a lot of other stuff going on. So yeah. that's the only ink that I have found that continues to show up in my pens because mm. I switch inks all the time. I have no right. interest in doing the same ink twice because there's so many. So yeah, right. I play with a lot of different inks and um, that hmm. one's the only one that I'm like, mm, it's time for some winter spice. Interesting. Have we done, have we, I'm sure we've done a pen gas question in the past that it's like, what's our go-to ink of every color? I'm sure we've done that before. It's ringing a bell. Probably, but probably. Maybe we and need you to know, do a refresher. And, and maybe like, you need some 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 pressure here. There's maybe some there's some good ones. I keep trying and like you know I tried some two Monteverde browns kind of recently. And uh -huh. They're fine, but interesting. E either, what do you find lacking in your browns? Drew? A lot of the times, and I'm going to be stupid here. A lot of the times, the shades fine, but just the names dumb. Oh, yeah. Okay. It's just I don't want to write it, and they're just it's not mm. it's not feeling right for me. So, mm. um, it just needs to. There's gonna be an X factor. I'm gonna I'm gonna know it when you I see like it. Know when you come across like, it. Like you know, know, I like um, uh, chocolate brown diamine. That's um, a good one. Yep. That's a good one. That's a good one. But I don't want to have to write chocolate brown. It's just the word chocolate brown. Know. Just and it's a little too dark. I want something just a hair lighter pretty, than that. It's pretty dark. It's pretty like yeah, like Hershey bar brown. Yeah, I want yeah. it a little bit lighter than that. Okay. Um, so I don't know, man. Huh. Still looking. It's a it's a journey. Okay. And also, I have very high standards for my browns. I mean, I feel like the fact that it's your name. Yeah, and like I, I use a lot of brown inks, but I'm like yeah. at this point, I feel like the pressure the pressure is on. Yeah, but like whatever like, brown that you have is like your number one. I brown. feel like maybe I'm just my my I've made up too many odd mm. things in my head and. Mm. No, nothing, nothing's going to be good enough. I Have you know. used uh, SBRE Brown? Steven, yeah, I own, Steven Brown's I, own, brown? I own a bottle of that. Yeah. Okay. That's a solid one. Yeah. That's right up there. Yeah. Maybe yeah. that's what you need to do is I mean, create it's no... your own brown. Oh, yeah. Make yeah. make up your own ink. Yeah, DC do a little, Brown. Do a little alchemy and mix something together, you know? I'll just change the label on Steven Brown's ink. There you go. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. but yeah, so that, as far as ink goes, I keep coming back to Diamine Winter Spice. Um, I love it. It's brown, it's green, it's blue all at the same time. That is marvelous. My three favorite colors. Mm. Oh yeah. Okay. Uh, as far as pens go, my surprising one, kind of like your traveler's pen, mm -hmm. has been my green aluminum Caveco Lilliput. Did not mm. expect. I I bought that because, you know, sixty bucks, a little bit of a discount. It's a cool color. And then cool color, a tiny tiny pen. It's yeah. fun. It's weird, but it writes so freaking well, and it yeah. does not dry out. Yeah. It is a miraculous pen. And I wonder if that's like the metal pen because like my travelers is the same way. It's like kind of a. Not that different of a pen, really, between yeah. the two of them. Yeah, I don't know. Well, this one's a um, this one's threaded though. True. Here's a snap cap. True. So I, I like the snap cap a lot more. I I don't use the lily put that much. Part, yeah. Partly partly because of the thread. I do prefer the snap cap too. Yeah. Because you, and you also have to thread it to post in order yeah. for it to be usable in yeah. the hand. So I wish that wasn't the I've case. I've tried using the lily put without posting it, oh. and it's a joke. No, you can't. I basically have to like hide it in my hand. It's like a magic trick. No, it's yeah. Like, but so that one has just earned its spot on a repeat visitor list just because <laughs> it just works so well. Uh, it might not come as a surprise to you, but my Pilot e, uh, my Pilot 912, my custom 912 with the FA nib, I've had it customized, I've had the feed changed mm -hmm. out. It's like my favorite pen. So I use that one all the time. 
I love it. It is just a razor blade, though. Like mm. on the page, you have to go slow. You basically, you, yes. if you if you put down any pressure when you go on an upstroke, it's like you can like stab the paper. You know, but you don't need to. But it's but it's tuned so well. You don't need to. You just mm. you just let it move up on its own. Yeah. But if you put any pressure down, you're digging in. Nah. But it's that fine. I love it so much because the flow is amazing. When you can have excellent flow on an extra, extra fine nib, yeah, love it. So that's beautiful. Love my 912. Also my E95S. That pen writes amazingly well. It's one of the best writing experiences out of the box you can get in the modern fountain pen industry, period. And I will fight you on that. It is just a beautiful writing experience. Isn't it, Brian? Sure. Come on. It is. The E95S writing experience. It is glorious. It really is good. It yeah. is so comfortable. Yeah. It you can it can work with anybody. It's not finicky in terms of positioning or anything like that. Mm -hmm. It's bouncy if you want it. It doesn't have to be, though. It's just a marvelous yeah. writing experience. Truth be told, I was daydreaming when you asked me that question. It took oh. me a second to realize <laughs> what pen you were talking about. So I do genuinely love the E95S. Yeah. Like that that but, is that is when I describe people like what <laughs> why you should buy the E95S as your first gold nib pen is because it does give you that different feel than a steel nib. Yeah. There are plenty of gold nibs out there that don't feel different. And when you buy them, like, oh my God, I just spent $300. And it it, it feels better. Like, yeah. no, no, E95, it's going to feel better. Yeah. So yeah, E95S, love it. Pilot Vanishing Point, extra fine. So here I am going back to the <sighs> extra fine. The My, my <laughs> black... <laughs> You all feel like so feedback-y. Here's and the like, thing, though. Ugh. Here's the thing. Again, I got to <laughs> give it to Pilot. My black matte Pilot Extra Fine Vanishing Point um, has such impeccable flow yeah. for an extra fine nib. A yeah. lot of the times, I feel like some companies might kind of stifle their flow a little bit by kind of pinching the time so that only a little bit of ink comes out mm. so that they can get extra fine. Mm. When a pen can flow liberally while also putting down an extra fine line, I just, it's such a beautiful thing. And also, dude, you know, it takes talent to be able to manufacture that. Oh my gosh, like yeah. you've done that before. You've tried to take a step down by grinding a nib. Like yeah, it's to do not that, easy. to do that and to make it smooth. Like, I mean, relatively and speaking. And to do it reliably. It's still a pointy piece of metal. It's going to be sharp, but like, yeah, but you it's, know, it's, you know, comparably of, smooth. of any nib that's that extra fine. Yeah. It's oh. probably the smoothest one I can think of. So I keep going back to my pilot vanishing point extra fine. It's a good one. Um, it's a good one. And, uh, Especially yeah. from like a factory nib, not having to go like yeah, custom right? or something. Oh yeah. yeah. That's. It's, it's vanishing. funny because like every time I pick it up, I'm like, oh man, you know what? I'm like, you know what? This is pretty better. And then I go like a finer medium. I'm like, oh, this is so much smoother. <laughs> <laughs> like, I keep I mean, going back to extra fines and I'm like, yeah, you know what? Maybe I was too hard on it. And then I go to like a broad and I'm like, nope, extra fines are the worst. These are the best. Well, no, hey, I, need another, to, I need smoother. Another reason why the extra fine <laughs> nib is the best on the vanishing point is because, let's be honest, the Con 40 converter, not the best thing in the world. Doesn't hold that much ink. You're not going to want to put a broad on there because otherwise you're going to write a page. And you're going to need to fill it up again. You want to have to fill that up as, worth as little as possible. <laughs> it's worth it. So, yeah, that's, that's mine. The Lilliput, the 912, the E95S, and the extra fine VP. Pretty solid list. Boom, boom. Ink colors, though. Do you have any inks that have surprised you? Um, that have surprised me. A butter popcorn surprised me. Yeah, um, true. You know that that's that's yeah. Because you weren't looking for a yellow. No, you don't even really like yellow. No, absolutely not. Yeah. Um, that just came at me. I tried it, and I'm like, oh my gosh! Like yeah. this is bright. It's like mm. legit yellow, mm. not orange, and I can still see it. And mm -hmm. yeah, that one that one shook me in the best of ways. And mm. unfortunately, it's no longer with us on this earth. So mm. uh, you know, Sorry. I've I've force myself to emotionally move on mm. um but uh yeah uh it's like the one-eyed teddy ruxpin of inks now oh god <laughs> <laughs> oh no yeah, I'm, still, every, I'm still clutching it yeah, like, it up every now i'm still and gonna just love you, you bad, yeah. i'm still gonna love you no matter what that's right <laughs> oh god cool yeah. all right um, finishing cool. up with the big question this week okay yeah i don't know what i'm in for on this one ah. so we're gonna see how this turns out um but darth blade 2016 says since we are in the midst of march how about a March Madness style bracket where together you have a showdown to determine one or all of the following? Number one, best writing pen or that is just a joy to write with regardless of looks. Two, most unique materials. Would love to hear your discussion on why the kryptonite body pen is superior to the adamantium pen because those both exist. And then three, best pen for daily carry and writing, which sounds kind of like number one. But it that's does. All right. And I, well, I, I wrote that down. So Okay. I like we'll where Darth. Work. I like where Darth Blade is coming from there. Yes. Um, uh, I don't know if we need to do like two different brackets. We can if we want to. 
Um, one and three are the same though. So if we wanted to focus on like, I feel hey, like one pen has to win the whole thing, right? That's yeah. The if point you, of a bracket. If you, I, I, I wrote up a bracket. Um, okay. Just ideating some of what I know our best sellers are. Okay. Um, so, oh, so you went with like an, an, an ar- unarguably most popular pens. Yes. Ones that people are actually buying. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, we 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 know what sells here, so mm-hmm. that might be different from place to place, but uh, these are ones that I know are super popular. Okay. Um, do you? We could just say, let's just see what you and I can agree on as being mm-hmm. the best, whatever that might be. Or if you want to put some some constraints on it, mm. we can do that. If we wanted to say best writing, or if we want to say biggest industry impact, or- I feel or, like we could go through and rank and have one pen to rule them all, okay. but then give some like superlatives. I like know? that. Okay, yeah. cool. All right, well, let me get my board. Okay, oh wow. We've got visual aids. Look at this. Right. Oh. Okay. Now to be fair, Drew and I don't know anything about sports. No, so when we he don't. initially mentioned a bracket, he was like, How many how many things are in a bracket? And then Janea helped us out and she was like, It's thirty two is usually what they start with. And he was like, Oh, oh. Yeah. So we're doing four and four. So it's a eight eight yeah. person bracket. Starting here. out starting out with eight. So we've got the uh, Lamy two thousand is gonna battle it out against the custom eight twenty three from Pilot. Oh. The Homo sapiens is going to be fighting the pro gear. I don't know if that's a slim or regular. I think we can put them both in. Um, Make it what you will. The Bennu Euphoria is going to tackle the Twisby 580. And then Pilot versus Pilot down here with the E95S pitted up against the Pilot Vanishing Point. Wow, this is a tough matchup. Yeah, I, I revise it a little bit here and there. Mm. You know, I tried to not do too many pilots, but <coughs> honestly, pilots are popular. Pilots are popular so, yeah. um, okay. you know, I think it's relative to what we see kind of making waves month to month here at the Goulet Pen Company. The mm. Euphoria being in there because they've been super popular recently with the... Um, uh, you know, uh, ex- exclusives like Earl Grey and okay. Ice Caramel Latte. Okay, so, so, the, um, so the criteria here, best writing pen, regardless of how it looks, most unique materials, and then daily carry, more or less. Or we could ignore that and just kind of say, what do we think is the best? Okay. So where do you want to start here, Drew? Let's start with the 2000 versus the 823. Oh boy, that is a tough, Tough matchup. I mean, I know what I like here. I'm gonna have to go 2000. I'm gonna go 2000 as well. Really? Yeah. Oh, I like, thought you'd be 823. No, I don't. I don't like the 2000 is more unique mm. and has stood the I test of He's time. He's pretty, He's pretty OCC. Pretty unique now too. you know what I want. You're, you're trying to go no, backwards. I'm now. Deba- I'm like, genuinely <laughs> debating because they're both great. <laughs> they are great pens. They are. And they have the 2000 is more durable. Selling points. 2000 is more durable. You get more ink capacity. More affordable. You, the the nib experience, the writing experience is better on the A23. I like the way that nib writes better. There's you're, more yeah. nib size options. You're, you're right. Oh, the filling mechanism is cool. It is, but it's neither a, mm, neither can be effectively disassembled. Not really. Not really. Not but with, not you can without, take the grip off the 2000. You can clean it out pretty easily that that's way. That's true. But then you can lose that little trim ring doodad as well. Yeah, I've never lost mine. I've taken my mine mm, apart dozens yeah. of times. Okay. Oh gosh, that's that's a really tough one. I'm gonna have to go 2000 just yeah. because I personally use that pen so much more. But it's really a toss up. Like I I could strongly make an argument for either one. All right. Okay, but we got to make a choice somewhere. Yep. 2000. Okay. 2000. We're moving on. Okay. All right. Now we've got the Visconti Homo Sapiens versus the Sailor Pro Gear. So very different pens mm-hmm. here. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, one definitely wins out with color variety, which is the pro yeah. gear for sure. But unique materials, I mean, the Homo sapiens 100%. wipes the floor. Wipes the floor with that. So that, uh, I will. I think it's safe to say that the sailors are going to write more consistently for sure. Yes. So they they definitely. win in terms of performance, but uh, they don't really uh, take any risks as far as designs or concept goes. Not not so much. They 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 not by comparison. They're adventurous the in terms sapiens. of storytelling and color. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, just you know, describing why. Yeah, but it's a very work. measured. It's a very measured. Um, it is approach. Not risk takers. Homo sapiens is just f- going out there. Not just, afraid of yeah, risk. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely not. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> this is a toughie. It is a toughie. Oh gosh. I. Uh, <laughs> I think that I'm the, really on the fence. I think the pro gears are great because they, I think, kind of cover the fountain pen fandom a little bit better than the Homo sapiens do. There's, there's something more for everybody. Yeah, and I think that it's more kind of just in tune with the people. I'd say I feel mm. like it. 
you know, and it kind of has dialed in what colors the users want. The Pro Gear seems to make colors that they're trying to have, you know, uh, you know, under understanding the users. The mm. Homo sapiens seems to kind of do what Visconti wants to do. Mm. I feel like if we open it up to, so I'm thinking about like what I personally like. Mm -hmm. I personally probably have used the Homo sapiens more, but I have way more Pro Gears and Pro Gear Slims in my collection because of the variety and color and theming and stuff like that. And the um, Homo sapiens is definitely more But if we expensive. take into account the King of Pens, the King of Pens puts it over the top for me because that one against the Homo sapiens, I mean, I love the lava material and the hook yeah. stuff. That is, that is awesome. Well, maybe but in order for us, maybe in order for us to get a victory, we need to just include all of both. Well, I think we have to, cause like the because Homo sapiens. there's a bunch of different Homo sapiens there too. There are, yeah, you gotta kind of look all encompassing. Yeah. So I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go pro gear. Okay, pro gear. This is a tough one too. These are close, close matchups with some very different um, pros and cons to both. But I'm gonna give it. To, I'm gonna give it to Sailor. Okay, the Pro Gear moves on. So okay. next, we're looking at the Bennu Euphoria versus the Twisby 580. Oh, dang, this is a tough match. So too, Drew. It is killing me. So the Euphoria oh. has just excited so many people, and it's also kind of an underdog story too. Like yeah. Bennu just launched their company in 2016, mm. and already they're even on this list. Yeah. The fact that I can put the Euphoria amongst these heavy hitters and mm. not feel like it's out of place yeah. is a statement. And I really yeah. don't feel like it's out of place. Not at our store anyway. Oh man. Bennu has been hopping and the Euphoria yeah. has been their vehicle that they have hopped mm. in mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. and thereabouts. Especially for us. We've done some banger exclusives with exactly. them with the Euphoria. So and that it is full of love. It is plugged mm. into the community. It is just unabashedly exciting mm. and explosive. Mm. But the 580 Oh, like babies. arguably the best or m at least most popular piston pen on the market. Yeah. Yeah. By volume, probably mm -hmm. I would have to guess. And they've done some really good colors too. They really you know, have that Prussian blue. And they and do, they done... do go out of their way to, you know, different, they do the somewhat different materials mm -hmm. with the ALs. And they've got, you know, lesser talked about, but they've got their own kind of underdog story too. They do. Um, Philip, you know, basically turned the company around a decade ago mm -hmm. and pivoted to sell fountain pens directly under their own brand. Taking a risk. Yeah, definitely. For sure. Like multi-generational kind of thing. So they both have good stories. Yeah, because I would <sighs> say that, you know, fountain pens really hadn't exploded in popularity the way, mm -hmm. like, Twisby came onto the Twisby scene. Was, they were a disruptor for right sure. Right around the time where we got started. Right, right. Um, so... Yeah. Still definitely some risk involved. Oh, yeah. U.S. economy Absolutely. was not doing so right. For sure. Yeah. It was an interesting time. So, oh, man, that one's so tough. Oh. It's, it's, if we're going on industry impact, you have to give it to the 580. Yeah. If yeah. we're going on just kind of like. I love the Euphoria. I love Banu. Yeah. I love working with them. For me, it's got to be the 580 just because, like, I've got a decade of history with yeah. it. And I've always enjoyed the 580. Yeah, they're so going that strong. That one edges it out for yeah. me a little Euphoria bit. Euphoria might get there one day. Yeah. I believe in them. But... Maybe. Maybe. Please let us know in the comments, too, by the way, what you all think about all yeah, this. Yeah, absolutely. If you're and our final already... one for the uh, quarterfinals or whatever they call Oh, my or, gosh. Uh, the Pilot E. I know. This oh. is going to be so painful. So the Pilot E95S versus the Vanishing, the vanishing point. point. Dang. Yes. All right. So oh, man. This is e, tough. The Vanishing Point, definitely more popular. The Black yeah. Matte Vanishing Point has been a bestseller for us yeah, since it decade. showed up. Yeah. So like mm -hmm. that is, that's like right up there with the 2000 as far as just like yeah. mainstay it's goes. It's always up at the top of the list, yeah. For me, I think the E95S is a better pen. Mm. Like just mm. talking about the pen itself, it feels good. It's the way it's designed is so comfortable. It's so beautiful. It is mm. one of the, and we talked about this on a previous episode a couple of weeks ago about like, what mm -hmm. do you think is the most beautiful pens? Mm. The E95S I think is just the most beautiful fountain pen. It's got really nice proportions. I've ever held. Yeah. Oh, stunning. Yeah, and the pressure cap, like the way the yeah. cap slides on, it feels so good. And it's made super well. Like nothing ever falls off or snaps off of it. Mm. Um, the vanishing point's nice. It's so practical. And they've done the engineering is yeah. really and cool. And no one has been able yeah. to come along and do it better. No, they really haven't. And that's so that, been out for decades. That's a big deal. And no one's ever topped it. Yeah. So, so that's, and they've done a bunch of different versions of it too. 
So there have been some pretty cool ones. I think about like Twilight. Yeah, so and they stuff definitely like have that. more like, color variety oof. than the E95S by far, which is sad because yeah. I think the E95S should have oh, more they colors. could do some more colors at E95S. Yeah. That would be amazing. Yeah. So personally, I think the E95S is better, but it's it's hard to say that it objectively is superior mm. than the vanishing point, especially when you take into account its industry impact. Yeah, I think it would have to go VP, but yeah. I know that that's some people are going to be yelling about that because the VP has a lot of lovers and it's got a lot of haters too. Yeah, a lot of people are really uncomfortable with that clip. Yeah, I've never had it as a problem for no, me, it's but not it all depends on either. how you hold your pen. Okay, so right, here we go. What's the matchup here we got? We got the Lamy 2000 versus the Sailor Pro Gear, which now includes the uh, King of Pens. King of Pens. Oh, crap. Mm. I, mm -hmm. I, I, I don't think you can touch the 2000 here. I honestly think that the 820. Really? I think the 823 is more of a challenge to the 2000 than the Pro Gear is to the 2000. Really? Yeah. Like, mm. in terms of popularity, mm. you know, the 823 is definitely more popular than the Pro Gears are. I don't know if you add up all the Pro Gears, though. All the Pro Gears. Yeah, all of them? Maybe. There's so many. <laughs> at, at, at any given time, yeah, there, there, there's quite a few. There's quite a few. Especially if you count, like, Slims, Pro Gears, yeah. and King of Pens. That's all. Yeah. That's a... That's a force to be reckoned with. Well, the there. fact that now we're only talking about like two 2000s here. We've got the stainless yeah. steel and the black one. So, But let's be real. We're basically just talking, talking about, about the, the black. black one. Yeah, The stainless steel is, that yeah. one's kind of heavy. And I actually, I mean, it's interesting, but it's it's kind of too heavy for me. I agree. And you lose the ink window. So that one I'm not as, but I do, I do. It is cool from like an engineering standpoint, but I think I've daily carried the stainless 2000 like once or twice ever. And I was like, this is just too much. That's a lot. Yeah. Now I will say, I enjoy writing with the Pro Gear more than I enjoy writing with the 2000. Really? Yeah, because it's mm. just, it's a consistent experience. I love the cartridge converter. I'm not mm. a piston guy anymore, but there were like two years solid where the 2000 mm. was my go-to pen. I've kind of moved on to, you know, just kind of minimum, down. Minimum, so like. minimum maintenance <laughs> mode for me. Okay. Um, but I do love writing with the 2000. Ah, the quick draw cap though, the snap cap on the 2000. It is fantastic. Is for, as a daily writer. Yeah. That's the, that's the thing that I would kind of knock against even the king of pens. You gotta, it takes time to like unthread. Now the posting is really good. So yeah, that's, that's pretty decent. That's good. You get more colors. Yeah. Um, um, oh, this is so hard. The flow is amazing on the 2000. The medium 2000 really is good. the smoothest nib I've ever written with in my life. Mm. It is really good. It's incredible. The broad is good too. Yeah. Um, oh Design wise, gosh. the 2000 wins. It's way more conceptual. It's way more creatively mm. built. And the the the, the, mean, the pro, pro gear when you break solid. when you break it down though, it's just like any other cartridge converter pen. You got a grip section. You got a feed. You got a nib. Yeah. You know, a friction fit nib. You got a. It's mm. it's constructed in no special way. The 2000 stands out a little bit yeah. more as its own thing. Yeah. Okay. I would probably give it to 2000. Yeah. Personally. Cool. Got to make a choice. And no one is shocked by this, I'm sure. Yep. <laughs> okay, now the Twiz B 580 versus the Pilot Vanishing Point. Ooh. Oh, yeah. This is tough. It is tough. So, very different price points. Yeah, very different pens. Yeah. Hmm. Piston versus a click retractable. Gold nib versus steel nib. Entry level yeah. versus kind of like first gold nib territory. Yeah. It's still. It's like, not really entry level. It's like 50, 50 to $80. Yeah. It, it approaches that like next level territory. Yeah. Which arguably you could say both of these are next level pens. They're just next level pens at different price points. Mm -hmm. But still gold mm. versus steel. That's, that's a big jump. You know, and the VP mm. is, you know, more than twice the price of. The, it uh, is. And you can get up into like the Rodden versions and get way up As there. are special editions. Those go up into 600, yeah, 500. Which you could argue that adds to the uniqueness and the versatility of them. Sure. Sure. You know? But uh, yeah, yeah. That is a tough one. The 580 has done, has probably progressed in its lifespan hmm. more than the Vanishing Point has, hmm. or at least in the last 10 years. I think about like how the Vanishing Point has pretty much maintained yeah. a level of popularity, but the 580 hmm. has really blazed a trail for itself, hmm. which I think gets it some extra points. Hmm. You got to consider that. Um, been, writing consistency, yeah. I think they both write extremely consistent. They do. They both um, write really well. I've never really had any problems with either of them ever. I feel like the extra fines and the fines are a better experience on the VP. Now again, you know, you the really the VP does suffer with capacity. You know, so that's where it, that's where it gets probably its biggest knock yeah. for me. And just like in terms of 
actually like daily writing, like the convenience of the click mm -hmm. cannot be beat. But if I'm holding it and writing with it for a long time, the 580 is a more comfortable pen in my hand. Yeah. You know, and the nib is just a little more visually appealing, mm -hmm. you know, having the, a nib with a big logo on it and stuff like that is there's something about that. Oh, that's a tough one. Boy, yeah. boy, oh boy. And they're so very different too. Yeah. Um. Jeez. I enjoy writing with Daily my King. vanishing point more. I like the slimness of it personally, mm -hmm. but I agree with you. I think that while yes, it is quick draw, the fact that it's kind of built to be an amazing carry pen, but also kind of doesn't have a big capacity, mm. kind of shoots itself in the foot a little bit, mm. where it's almost a perfect carry around pen, but you know, mm. if you're carrying around, the that's all the you have. The incapacity thing is really like the biggest knock against yeah. the VP. Yeah, but that nib, that extra fine nib, mm. again, it has a better <laughs> extra fine than the 580 does. Yeah, but I don't care about that. I well, don't like the, the, anyway. the, the 580 has a better broad nib. It is They're both really good broads. super juicy. They're both really good broads. Actually, yeah. the VP broad's pretty amazing. Um, oh man, in terms of the one that I actually use the most, it would be the 580. All right, let's go with that. So, I like that. And I kind of like, we've uh, already- That pains me, that pains me. I am not confident about that answer, by the way, just in case y'all are like, why'd you put the VP in the Hall of Fame? <laughs> well, here, But not the 580, like the 580 is not old enough. That's I like why. this because we get to talk about the 580 and the 2000. And we've talked about the vanishing point in the 2000 before. Mm. So I think this is new, this is fresh. This is a, yeah. this is a different matchup and a very different, and a very- uh, This is an interesting matchup. It is. 580 versus the Lamy 2000. I think you can say a lot that you could about the 580 versus the vanishing point, but the Lamy 2000 has the capacity. Mm -hmm. And it is a quick draw. There's it doesn't no, have as much capacity as the 580. No, it doesn't. But it's never, I've never found it lacking. No. Like I'll take the Lamy 2000 on like a multi-day business trip where I'm writing the entire time and I never need to refill the right. book. Right. And, so. and like the vanishing point though, it is quick to use with the um, snap cap, solid yeah. post, but it has capacity. So it can do what the vanishing point can't in that regard. What are you talking about? No, not vanishing point. You said vanishing point. I mean, the 2000 can do what the vanishing point can't do. Why are we talking about vanishing point though? Because we because we were talking about how the 580 is better than the vanishing point. In we're terms not talking of, about the vanishing point. I know, it I know, but I'm saying, I'm saying, but the the the, the 2000 <laughs> uh -huh. uh, does give you that portability. Yeah, with capacity, it does. But they both do. The 580, the 580 and the 2000 threads though, both do. The 580 threads is that a plus or a minus? It's a minus. You you were talking about how you appreciate. How... That's just like a personal preference of mine. Well, you could you argue. You, you that could the... argue that it like is more like solidly. But that's what you said when we were talking about the 2000 versus the Pro Gear. But I like, I like the, Pro, that. the Pro Gear on threads, and you said that that's not as good. Okay, I will say that if you're posting the 2000, that thing posts deep. It's secure on oh, there. Oh, so nice. The 580 technically from Twisby's not even supposed to post. You yeah. can do it though. I yeah. mean, everybody can do it. Um, but you're posting it onto the filler knob. Mm -hmm. Theoretically, you could like end up inadvertently twisting yeah. the knob, but uh, you would have to twist it like two or three rotations worth yeah. I still don't to like have it. ink come out of it. I don't like doing that though. It gets really long and kind of heavy. So it I does. don't post my 580. So there is that. 580 definitely wins on color variety by far. It, because it has any. Any. Yes. yes. I mean, you've had a couple limited edition VPs that have been like a dark brown or a dark blue. Ah, now you said VP. Ha ha. Did I really? Yeah. Crap. Sorry. <laughs> 2000. I know. to say. Dang it. But yeah, um, they had the Bauhaus and the Yeah, that but that's like was. there were so few of them. No, and they were like even... obscenely expensive. Yeah, yeah. Oh man, this is tough. This I mean, they tough. both win in their respective price points. I mean, doing, you're going to doing... win with any of these pens. Let's yeah. be real. These are all great pens. Yeah. Um gosh. I feel like if we're weighing heavily in this version of the bracket about the uniqueness of materials, I mean, you have the uniqueness of like the two materials that the 2000 is made of. Yeah. Polycarbonate and stainless steel. But like what other pen does that? Uh, nobody yeah. really. I mean, very, very seldom do you see uh, I mean, stainless, you see a little bit more, but not polycarbonate. Yeah. Which I, I don't know why. It's a great material yeah. for a oh, pen. It's super strong. Maybe it's like really hard to manufacture. I, I mean, I for, for me, the Lama 2000 does everything that the 580 does, mm. but does it better. 
The only thing it doesn't do better, in my opinion, is the color variety. The color variety and the ink, like sloshiness, the sloshy factor. You get to see that ink moving around. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Which is cool. I'll give you that. But you also see the ink drips inside the cap, which is also not amazing. Yeah. I mean, the, the 580 hasn't gotten its way into the Hall of Fame yet. It hasn't, but it's not old enough yet. That doesn't qualify. It still wouldn't yet. have it's been. It's on the brink. It's on the edge, though. Yeah. I don't know if it technically qualifies. I think, so I was debating about that. Like, does that qualify for the 10-year requirement for the Hall of Fame? But it depends if you count, like, the, five, the 540, 40, 530, the, 30, yeah. the original. Really, I wouldn't because they're, no. they're different models of mm -hmm. pens. So I actually need to look up when the 580 actually came out because it's close to a decade if it's not there already. The Eco, I know, is not no, there no, yet. No, no, not yet. It's close. So, so all right, uh, why, why wouldn't we give it to the 2000? I mean, come on. I feel like we just give the 2000 so much love that, I know, know, but it, does, it, it deserves time. it. It really does. Yeah, I'll give it, I have to give it to 2000. <laughs> okay. I have to. All right. I really didn't set out to do that at the beginning of this, but there's a reason why I talk about it a lot and I carry it around everywhere. It's just, if you like... What that pen has to offer, it does it better than anything else. All right. So there you have go. it, folks. Lamy 2000. There you go. Wins our bracket. Cross it off on your bingo cards. Drew and Brian giving love to the 2000. I mean, the bracket doesn't lie. And I and I don't I don't think I put I um let's see. I, I, I pitted it against some you did. worthy contenders. It went up These against not the, easy. It went up against the 823 and the Pro Gear. Yeah, that's so that's I tough. wasn't giving it a buy. Yeah, I'm curious. What do y'all think? Did you do your own bracket along with us? And what came out on top for you? Probably the 2000 because it's the best. But <laughs> anyway, that was a fun question. Thank you very much, Darth Blade, for throwing that out there. Yeah, that was fun. And thanks, Drew, for organizing that. That was. Uh, Whew, literally I'm sweating a little bit. I'm like, oh man, I, I hate, I put, hate like, having to narrow things down like this. I put I love no them thought into it. I just pick the things that I know are popular, plop them on a chart. And, Fair enough. Well, I appreciate yeah. all that hard work. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so if you want to keep asking us questions, we'll keep answering them. Um, you can ask us questions either on the YouTube community page. You can do it in the comments uh, on this video, or you can email us at pencast at gulepens.com and we will check those out. All right, next up, we're going to give some love to a not oft- celebrated version of pen, which is a lanyard pen. So this will be the Monteverde Ritma Gala and uh, Gala, Gala. I don't actually know how to say it, but we'll say it however we want. Girl. We're gonna show it to you right now. All right. All right, here we go. All right, folks, Monteverde. There it is. A world of luxury and innovation, TM. So comes in its own box. It's, you know, plastic, it's fine. But for a pen in this price range, it's not bad. What is the price range? I want to say it's thirty-six dollars, if oh. I'm not mistaken. I could be wrong about that. Wow, that is diminutive. Yes. What does that mean? Small. I don't know. Oh, yes. It's a little pen. You know, it's well, I have big hands, so I make it look even smaller. But you know, next to my this is not a great example, but next to my traveler's pen, it's somewhat comparable, which is one of the other lanyard pens that we have. Um, so there you go. There's that one here. Drew's got a mythos over here. The Scani Mirage Mythos, which looks like a, just an absolute beast compared mm. to these, but this is kind of an average size pen, yeah, I would say. Yeah, I think so. So these are, these are little pens. Get these out here. We're talking about the Gala. Gala, 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 I don't know, how do you say it? I realize I say it different ways. Like I'll say Gala sometimes and I'll say Gala sometimes. I always say Depends Gala. On the context, yeah? Yeah, like a dance, it's a Gala. Yeah, I don't know. I'd sit down, yeah, I don't know, whatever. I think some people say Gala apples though. Yeah, I, don't I say Gala apples. I don't when say I'm talking Gala about apples a, because a dance or whatever. I'm the only apples are Granny Smith apples. Well, that's all that matters. That's no, that's not <laughs> the case. <laughs> I'm a Honeycrisp man myself. Oh, anyway, uh, it only comes in one color, black. Uh, I got to talk first about what it comes with because there's things happening. So you go underneath subterranean in your pen box here. So it shows you a bunch of other Ritmas, but they're not Galas or Galas. Uh, this one talks a little bit about how to do the conversion, which is helpful because it comes in non-lanyard mode. So if you want to go lanyard mode, you got to swap the top, right? So we're going part of what we're going to show you here today. And then it uses a standard international ink cartridge with some instructions there, and it uses 
a converter, the little mini converter, oh. which actually holds less ink than a cartridge. But if you want to use a converter, you can. And that's what I inked it up with. Then you got your lanyard. You get a black cartridge, a blue cartridge. They're fine, but I used the converter. So how does the lanyard work? Well, Tell me. I will show you. It's a black lanyard to match the black pen. So is it elasticy? It's or, like rubbery. Oh, rubbery. Okay. It feels kind of rubbery. It's not. It's it's got a little bit of stretch to it, but not a lot. It's not like a rubber band that you're going to want to pull really hard on it. What's going on with that metal so closure? This is the this is the connector. So this is how it's. I don't know if you how fine you can see it, but basically you twist it, and then it comes oh, out. Oh, so, that's you know, weird. Well, it's like a necklace clasp. I've never seen I anything believe. like that. It's like a twist clasp. So it's like yeah, it's got like a little hook in there. It's exactly like the um, Platinum Curados, how that kind of like, it's got a little pin and you kind of hook it in there oh. and then it latches. So, you know, but me personally, I have a big head and I can just throw this over my head. There you go. I think, I don't, let me double check that. Well, I can't right now because you can't really see what I'm doing. So I'm not going to do it off camera, but either way you have options. I mean, I can always point the camera at you. That's crazy talk. What are you <laughs> talking about? Um, so in order to swap this out, you just, with your fingers, you can just unscrew the top. Boom. And then, hello, you can see the nib is inside there. And then literally you just screw this on. It's pretty simple. And I guess if you want to, you can take the lanyard part off. And just and have a little nubbin. Have a nubbin, you know, kind of like the Travelers. Yeah. Just a little nubbin on the top, except I don't have a little extra swapper, swapper doodle. So there you go. So if you want to rock this thing around your neck, or swing it around and hit people with it, you can do that. Now we're talking. You have that option with this pen. Um, I like the color. The ruthenium part here is a fingerprint magnet. Like, I, I don't even know that I've touched this part yet and it's got fingerprints all over it. I'm just kidding. I touched just it. Just look at it. So I inked it up already. But um, yeah, it will never be free and clear of fingerprints unless you wipe it and place it in the box with gloves on. And then as soon as you touch it again, it'll, it'll be inked up. So if you're familiar with the the Ritma, it is magnetic. So truth be told, when we first heard about this, um, we were thinking, no way do we want to carry this because it's a lanyard pen with a magnetic enclosure. As you're walking around, isn't the thing just going to fall, Pop off, fall yeah. off? I don't think that's the case. Um, it feels like a pretty strong metallic um, or uh, a magnetic closure there. Um, I guess technically you could walk around with it like that. There you go. Your neck nice if you and stabby. Or maybe if you don't want to ink it up, you just want to have it as a nice decorative piece around your around your neck. Definitely a conversation just, starter. Yeah, you can just walk around with it like that. Um, yeah, so it's got a little bit of a step to it, but not too much. No. So, I mean, I have big hands, so like I can write with it like this, but it's like right in the crook of my hand there. So I would want to write with it posted, um, and you know my thumb is not even like close to the grip uh, as I want to write with it, but it's fairly comfortable to me. It's not a, I mean, it's a fairly thin pen, but it's not so thin, you know, um, if I compare it to, this is just that pen that I have handy. Um, that's kind of comparable. It's definitely a thicker grip than we have on the Travelers. Um, and it's thicker than the Lily put as well. So in terms of that, it's actually a fairly practical writer in that respect. Um, however, the only nib that it comes with is the OmniFlex. So this is a number five size OmniFlex, and you can tell it's got the little wings there with the cutouts. Um, so it is a flexible nib. It's a flexible steel nib. So it's not the most soft writing flexible nib in the world, but it's workable. And if you want to flex it out a little bit, you can. Most of the other OmniFlexes we have that come from Monteverde are number six nibs. So this is one of the few number fives that I think we even have. I think they've had it on the Monza maybe. Um, but then, so I've inked it up with Robert Oster Blue Water Ice and I'll show you real quick what I have going on with the converter. So there you go. So <laughs> it's funny, I inked up the converter with a syringe and then I allowed the ink to flow down through and half of the converter oh, wow. is gone just with what's in the feed. There's a lot that can fit in the feed. Yeah, so um, if you are filling the converter through the pen, then you're fine. Oh, I will say if you're going to be writing with it posted with the lanyard, it gets pretty awkward. I see that. I don't think it's probably designed necessarily to be done that way, but you know what? You do you. Um, so I have blue water ice in here. Um, Nib is pretty responsive. 
Um, it's probably, I don't know exactly what nib size this is supposed to be. I would say like fine, medium, somewhere in there. It's fairly standard size, maybe a fine nib. What do you think, Drew? I, don't know I think it's a fine. Somewhat close there. Um, you can get line variation. I got to press pretty hard to get that line variation, but it springs right back. You know, it's not unpleasant. Um, and then, you know, there it is. It does have a little bit of a I squeak hear to that. it. You can hear it, right? I don't know if that's just this nib or I haven't heard this as like, because we've sold a bunch of these. I don't, I haven't heard this as being a common thing. This can happen every now and then. It's literally just like, probably needs to be smoothed a little bit, but. It's a, it's a singer. It's singing just a, just a skosh. Honestly, a little like figure eight on a micro mesh would pretty much take that away. Or even a, um, the other one, not micro mesh. What is it? Mylar. The, Mylar. There you go. So there you go. I mean, overall, it's not like the most amazing writing experience, but I would say it's more the convenience factor and the, the, the portability and all that kind of stuff. If you like lanyard pens, I mean, this is going to be a great option, especially yeah. for its price. It's a very solidly built pen. Um, you know, the only thing is the nib, uh, you know, is not like my number one choice, but it's respectable. Like it writes better than I would have expected, to be honest with you. I don't have a lot of experience writing with these number five. Okay. So um, could you go with another nib? Well, that was initially what my thought was. So I'm just going to pull it off, which normally you wouldn't want to necessarily do that with an inked pen, but you know, here we are. <laughs> For the sake of time, I'm going to. So get that off of there. Um, I have a Goulet number five nib, which, you know, if you have an Edison number five or um, anything in that range, there's a lot of Kawakos and stuff that would be uh, in that size. I can't remember if we have Monteverde number five spare nibs or not. I know we have sixes, but. Yeah, um, I don't think so. Either way. Um, I don't know if it has to fit in in an exact way. I think it does, because I think the feed itself will only fit in. A certain way and it's kind of awkward to do it yeah you can here while i'm on camera too. let's see where are you at there we go so yeah just kind of spinning around and it, it kind of drops it right in and then one thing i did notice is like you know it drops in there pretty deep like oh, it yeah. actually it actually covers the the nib size um but uh i have swapped it in here it's very easy to fit it in it was actually harder to pull out the other one um, so I'm curious now, of course it's got to like get going because I did, whenever you swap it out like that live, it might take in a second to get it going. I'll try to like shake it down in there. Mm -hmm. Let me force a little ink down. Oh, I think, you, I think it started. Did it start like right as I was pulling I saw away? a little dot. Oh, there it goes. Okay. So I would have to write with this for a long period of time to see, you know, how well it would hold up. But it's the nibs in there pretty securely. Um, it feels pretty good. It's not, you know, it goes in further than the other nib does. So, um, you know, I know they use maybe some different feeds than what is typically on Yovo uh, like uh, stuff because Yovo is who makes our nibs. Um, but anyway. It looks consistent. Seems to be working just fine. I believe this is an extra fine nib that I put in here. Yeah. So I would say the 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 OmniFlex is a fine. So, I mean, that's an option. Not that we, you know, there's a ton of options for number five nibs, but they're around. Um, we have some Goulet ones if you wanted to swap it out. It color-wise, it sort of matches, but whatever. Yeah, I think it's um, fine. So that's an option, but you know, uh, let me just make sure it caps okay and everything. Yeah. It's fine. Great. So it's a viable option. I would say it's what an extra 14 bucks or so to get that new. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's an interesting pen. Honestly, we almost didn't carry it because we were like lanyard pen. Like who wants that? Um, but then people started buying it. Yeah, so. I think we've sold out like twice already. Yeah. So I don't know. We wanted to make this video for the pencast several weeks ago and we kept running out of the pens. So it was like, hey, we have stock of them right now. We'll just talk about it while we have them, and then y'all can see what you like. But, All right, mm -hmm. well, we need you to try it on for the, for the people oh, at home. Oh, of course. Well, I've, we're gonna need to see it on just here. how stylish it looks. Look I, at that. Right? And of course, I like to add other pens on here too. Of course. You know, because if you're gonna go big, then you go bigger, you go home. That's right? right. So, you know, if you wanna have a whole trio. Drew, your three pen, you know, thing right here. Oh, Look, there we go. You got them all right there. Now we're talking. You know? 
And uh, I have tested, I think I've put like eight or 10 pens on here at one time. I remember it that. It's a little bunched up. Didn't you put bottom. a customer Rushi on there? I did. Yeah, Mad it held. Man. It held. It's a pretty strong little necklace, but I was just sitting at a desk. I wasn't moving around very much. Can't say I'd want to be walking around the office like swinging around <laughs> with a customer Rushi hanging on my neck. Even your Visconti is like probably a little nicer than what I'd want to have on there, but it definitely will hold the pen that it comes on. So there you go. You got options. And then you don't have to worry about the clasp thing. The clasp honestly is kind of annoying, but I don't wear a lot of necklaces. So I'm sure if but you, now you can wear necklaces, you'll be more used to weird clasps. But there you go. That's the, that's the Ritma Gala. Gala. Gala Gala. Gala Gala. That was the most productive part of the pencast, right? Now we're on to just the goof goofball part. That's right. What's happening? Okay, Drew, what is happening in your world? Well, the Goulet Pen Company allowed us, us. a half day for mental health yes. paid last week. Yes. Um, I did have some errands to run. Mm -hmm. um, I needed to pack everything before our mountain trip weekend for my mm. birthday. However, I said, you know what? I'm being paid to go do something mentally healthy, it would mm. be dishonest of me not to go to Waffle House for my mental health. Oh, well, so that is what I did because I that's respect what that looks like for you. I respect you and the Goulet Pen Company that much. I did that for you. It helps my mental health you, to know that there you're you go. truly yes. using it Thank for you. your mental health. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. So I did go to <laughs> Waffle House. I sat down at the bar as I do, mm -hmm. and I enjoyed myself some waffles, and I enjoyed them to the point where I was honestly kind of like restraining myself from just like cursing under my breath because it was so good. I'm sitting there, I'm literally like, just like, just, like it was that nourishing to my wow. soul. I'm wow. like, I wanted to, if I was just in at home, I would be acting up. It was that delicious. <laughs> I love how I've ever acted out because I've food I've been eating. Oh man. Yeah. If, I, if, it, if it gets to a certain level, oh my God. Yeah. If I have that shrimp and grits at food for thought in mm. Williamsburg, mm. golly. Mm -hmm. I don't I just, it is some of the most exhilarating things I can do. <laughs> so yeah, I ate the half of the waffle, everything else. And it was just incredible, just incredible. So That's awesome. I had that moment of peace and delight. And then I went home, mm. packed up some stuff. I actually needed to go get my kid. We got a haircut and then we went home, packed up everything so that when mm. Shannon got off, got off work, we could go straight to the cabin. Yeah. So that's what we did. We went up to uh, the Shenandoah Mountains here in Virginia. Mm -hmm. And uh, my wife rented a beautiful A-frame cottage for my 40th birthday weekend. And uh, it had a hot tub out there on the porch, a beautiful mountain view. It mm -hmm. uh, The amenities were fantastic. They had, you know, the, the a carafe coffee maker, a K-cup coffee maker, just a, you know, a kettle, a water filter with wow. a ton of different like hot chocolate teas, all that mm. stuff. Um, and then they had complimentary mugs with like the little name of the cottage printed on there that we could just take home. Uh, cool. Just a great place. Everything worked. Everything, you know, locked appropriately. Mm. You know, the instructions that we had got us into the house just fine. The only bit of confusion was uh, that we had a little bit of a hard time finding the house initially. Mm. There were no lights on or anything and the oh. the actual house number was very hard to see. So we drove around a little bit trying to find the house. Okay. We eventually did, it wasn't a big deal. But um, when we got there, we were, we were excited to get into the hot tub and we did, it was nice, but it was so cold up there. When really? we got out of the hot tub, it was absolutely just oh, torture. See, I love that. It was a bit much. Like I like, nah, I like I love the, it. Oh, I want it to be. It, it freezing outside. Yeah, I mean, sometimes it's fun. Like if you go into a hot tub and you jump right into a pool. Yeah, like, that's so that can sometimes be fun. Yeah, this, like, this was less fun than that because you had things like sticking to you and stuff. Like mm. I don't know, it mm. was a bit much. But uh, so it, it, it warmed up the, the following days though. So okay. Okay. Uh, we woke up the next morning. Uh, we just had you know a, a roll of um, you know Pillsbury cinnamon rolls that we had um, mm. gotten. We That's made good. those. Just sat around, you know, read, played on our devices, had cinnamon rolls, looked at the mountains because at that time we had seen it in the daytime, so we could see the view clearly. Nice. It was just what I wanted. I just wanted a chill, relaxing mountain weekend and. Usually that's not Shannon's cup of tea. Uh, she likes to go to places where they're shopping. Um, mm. I don't care about that. So this was for me and it worked. It hit my bullseye just perfectly. And it was a slow morning 
And then we just kind of decided uh, to go on a very easy little trail. Mm -hmm. I did a little bit of research to find something that would be, you know, amenable to my child and my wife who have never actually hiked before. Mm. Um, and honestly, I have this weird thing with the left side of my left foot is just hurting randomly for some reason. So I'm like, I don't want to do anything super strenuous mm. either. Probably because you're turning 40. Because 40, yeah. Falling apart. Great. Right? It's all done. Hopefully. Um, yeah. So I found a trail that was paved like oh literally it was handicap accessible so um i mean that's cool that's pretty much a green light for us so like all right there we go <laughs> nothing bad could happen there yeah. it was a very short one that'd, that'd um, be classified as a fairly yeah fairly uh accessible hike for people but who it don't had hike enough rocks yeah. around the trail that archer could go act crazy Do on so. climbing yeah kid, kid things yeah so that was fun so we knocked that out little walk to a nice little vista we took a couple selfies and then we thought we did notice that the trail was not too far away from uh luray caverns mm -hmm. so we went ahead and did that shannon had never done that really? before mm -hmm. that's cool um i remember doing that years ago it's fun she and i had gone to a cave in iowa illinois somewhere i don't know um she didn't love it hmm. but you know, because she can get a little claustrophobic. Um, that can but, happen in a cave. But this one is much bigger. It is bigger. And she felt confident that she'd be okay. Mm -hmm. um, and she was for a while. Oh, boy. It got to the point, though, where it just kept going on and on and That's on. A big, it's a big cave. And she, uh, it was kind of crowded at points. Oh, really? And knowing that like you have to just stand there mm. without having any forward motion got to her a little bit. She didn't like start freaking out or anything, but mm. I could tell that she was she was done. Not having the best time. Yeah, so yeah. we kind of picked up the pace a little bit um, okay. and uh, got out of there, but uh, overall mm. fun was had. And, Did you, you see know, the organ? Uh, it was there. It was. We didn't wait around to hear it be played okay. because that was around the time where she was like, yeah. I could tell by her face that we were... You kind of that wasn't going to add anything to the experience. No, at that point. Yeah. no, and they have luckily, an organ that they've made out of the stalag tights slash mites. I don't mm -hmm. remember which it is, yeah, but it's pretty neat. Yeah, well, great. <laughs> um, but uh, I'm sure it was not neat at all. Stop it. Uh, so we did I mean, that. It was, it was fine. It was very forgettable. There you go. Thank you. That's what you need to be saying. Yeah. Cool. So we did that. That was nice. Uh, found a random little mineral shop we went into on our way back mm. went back had a little bit of time to kill got back in the hot tub it was now during the daytime so it was perfect very mm. still cool mountain air but not yeah. like painful when you got out just okay you know like whoo you know that good mm. that good mm -hmm. feel. Mm -hmm. and uh showered before dinner went to a um it the we found a restaurant it happened to be at a ski resort a small smaller ski resort not like okay. wintergreen mass and nothing it was a right. uh, a ski resort called Bryce. Um, I had never heard of it, but I've never heard of they it. had a little restaurant right there at the base of the slopes, mm. and uh, there was still snow on the slopes. And oh, the, wow. the hostess asked if we wanted to sit by the window at an eight top um, because it had a good view. And we're like, yeah, sure, as long as we're not taking a you know eight seats away <laughs> from somebody else. We're like, no, 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 we're all good. So she sat us right up next to the window, and there was well, that's cool the slopes right behind us. Yeah, I had never, you know, I've never eaten at a place where I could see ski slopes before. So yeah. that was kind of a a bonus thing that I didn't think was ever going to happen in my yeah. life. So and it was also like seventy five degrees this weekend in up Richmond. Up there it was yeah, up there it was yeah. colder for sure. But it's like a but, two hour drive and you're up in the slopes. Yeah, which yeah, it's kind of wild. Yeah. So that was that was pleasant. I just had a burger. It wasn't anything fancy. It was just like a lodge restaurant, but yeah. um, it got the job done. But it tasted better because you were looking at slopes. It really did. It was a good <laughs> burger too. Yeah. You know what I also had. I don't. We tell before, me before we left. We wanted to get something just quick to you know get on the road as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. My wife does not like McDonald's. I she likes McDonald's for breakfast, but otherwise she's like, nope, it's garbage, disgusting. No, thank you. Okay. Uh, I don't care. I'll eat any sort of junk. But Clearly. I wanted a McDonald's burger, and I wasn't. I wasn't gonna like. She's like, that's fine. Mm -hmm. I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm not gonna. Let's just get go. We gotta get gas anyway. Let's go buy Wawa and see what they have, and we just get some snacks or whatever. Okay. Um, we went over to the little counter we can boop 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 on the machine and yeah. order some stuff mm -hmm. i ordered a burger at wawa at wawa yeah they have burgers i went ahead and added extra patty on there okay it was good yeah it was good it was better like, than mcdonald's yes it was like a real burger it actually like had that like the there was real beef patties on that thing mm. yeah totally okay thumbs up to wawa burgers now, here's the bad part. I was very hungry, so I was like, yes, two patties. Thank you very much. Yeah. And then I got a bit much. 
for for to drive, yes. Oh. So normally I know what I can get at McDonald's if I need to drive and eat at the same time, you know, something very manageable. Oh, I this, see. This, no. So we just sat there, parked while I ate my messy burger. It's like, all right, mm, well, I'm see. not going to be unsafe. This would be both unsafe and disgusting and drippy. <laughs> so yeah. yeah, didn't do that. But anyway, yeah, Fair. Wawa Burgers, man. Okay, I'll Good stuff. Into that, yeah. Um, my favorite part of the trip though was our final night there after we had done all that stuff. After we came back home from dinner, um, we uh, put the kid to bed, got in the hot tub one last time, and then came in. And they, there were no TVs, but they did have a projector. Hmm. And it was a Bluetooth projector. And we okay. uh, hooked up Shannon's tablet to the projector. And then just as we do every weekday night, we watched an episode of Community while we had some sparkling uh, Welch's grape juice. <laughs> nice. In, and it was just like... We were still like just dried our hair and we were just, you know, in, you know, hoodies and PJs Mm -hmm. and I was eating Cheez-Its and coffee and she had (laughs) some other snack and it was just like just a standard lazy day moment. But, Mm. you know, it just made me really thankful that I can enjoy these kind of, uh, despite all the little random adventures we had, like what Mm. I just love most is just kind of sitting on the couch with her, Mm -hmm. watching some TV, yeah, just knowing that I'm just got a happy marriage, great kid. And I can do stuff like this in my life, you know, and at, at, at 40, you know, you kind of, you're going to start evaluating things differently. And yeah. I've been thinking about that a lot and I've been evaluating things. Yeah, it's about and, time you settled down, Drew. You've been kind of a party animal for a I while. I tell you, you know, so, I know, you know that's totally me. Glad but you like, appreciate these th- things. Things just, yeah, things are just really good. And I'm really, really appreciative, really grateful um, for everything. And then, uh, so we went ahead and did the drive home, another trip swerving down and up the mountain. Dropped off Archer at my brother's house so that we could, me and Shannon, go to our friends Jim and Dan's uh, show. They did Mm -hmm. a, uh, you know, um, cabaret. So just selected songs from shows they had both done. These was another one of the couples we went to Disney with. with. Mm, Okay. And um, they are just some of the most talented, lovely people I've ever known Mm -hmm. in my life. And um, they did, you know, husband, husband show. And that was a big deal for them (laughs) because, you know, you've got the the, kind of the classic introvert, extrovert couple thing going on. So it was a big deal for them to both get up there and, you know, do that thing and just (laughs) kind of be so transparent. And uh, it was hilarious, funny, heart wrenching, you know, the whole thing. They just did a great job. But then of course, everybody got together and went over Josh's house afterwards. And Shannon's like, I I didn't know we were doing a thing. Drew, can we do a thing? I'm like, ah, it's like school night now. (laughs) Like, all right, you go find a, find a, ride with somebody yeah i'll go get archer then i'll go home let the dogs out feed the dogs get archer i'll tell him he can bring anything he wants and then i'll come <laughs> meet you over josh's and we can hang out a little bit there so you go. i did i was like you can bring your switch you can bring whatever you want he's like oh okay so nice of course he was playing that thing like all weekend anyway so whatever it's never enough i'm sure it's a vacation yeah. what are you gonna do yeah so it was a packed weekend yeah non-stop it's active non-stop yeah. so uh, but it was nice getting in my own bed. It was they had uh, Tempur-Pedic mattresses at the rental house, and okay. while nice, I feel like if have you ever slept in one of those? Uh, not really, but I know. So you really do like my son's s- got a foam mattress. You sink into yeah. a. It makes you sink into a shape yeah. of you. I've got like a topper on my bed that's like a two inch. No, foam. this thing's the whole mattress. Like yeah. so, you sink into a. I feel like, like that would feel really hot to me because I'm a very warm body in sleeping. Maybe mode. for for me, the only inconvenience was like to get to like reposition yourself. Mm. There's still a human shaped form in the mattress now, oh, yeah. So you need to kind of like get up and out of your human, <laughs> you know, cavern, <laughs> yes. and then create a new one next to it. And it's just like I don't know. It's not easy for me to just kind of. It's not as responsive as a regular mattress. Yeah, yeah. it's not easy for me to shift around. Yeah, you have to kind of like establish a new print when i was in uh, high school i had my parents old water bed so i slept on a water my bed. parents had a water bed that i never had it but it's amazing that they're not more popular I, anymore i thought they were cool yeah they're kind of terrible though i think it was supposed to be better for your body but it turns out it's worse in like every way plus I mean, like they there's, can there's probably a reason why. really heavy oh and, yeah they'll destroy yeah. a home yeah so we yeah. never had any Catastrophes happen with ours, but yeah, my parents definitely had a water bed. Mine eventually leaked, uh, but it wasn't a bursting leak. It was like a slow leak, mm. and then it like smelled kind of moldy and oh, gross, and yeah. then that was the end of the the water bed. Dang. But yeah, yeah, they had a water bed, and then when they yeah. split up, my dad took it, and so mm. he lived in this little tiny house with his sister, but he had that water bed in his room. 
Wow. I feel like it's a very 80s thing. Oh, yeah. It's like waterbed. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And the amount of like wood that thing was encased in. Was oh, like, yeah. It was just, I can't imagine how much yeah. it weighed. Like waking up and getting out of that bed was, it was an experience. It was like a, like a physical adventure. Yeah. Well, the, that <laughs> whole massive, because they had like a, a mirror and like drawers and stuff on the yeah, top. Yeah, like, that's how this one was. Like the amount of, I mean, just the wood alone oh, yeah. was heavy, but that, yeah. like are houses meant to have things like that in the bedrooms? I don't know. Like that's a lot of weight. It's a lot of weight. Yeah. Golly, I don't, I don't know. know. Yeah, but uh, that was my weekend. A whole whole lot of stuff going on, but. Hmm. um, Busy. Here I am. Yeah, you made it back in one piece. Made it back. That's pretty cool. And it's like notable, you know, 40th birthday yeah, that, kind that, of that's thing. that's what Shannon wanted. She's Memorable like, I just, I just want you to, I want to do something that you can say, hey, on my 40th, we did this thing. And I'm yeah. like, I, mission accomplished. Yeah. Yeah. It's got me thinking. It's like, Rachel and I don't do a lot of that well, this kind didn't, of stuff. This didn't take a lot. Like, there was like almost yeah. no planning involved. We just found a place on Airbnb that looked nice. And, yeah. you know, I think okay. you put down like half your deposit and, yeah, it was Super, low. and we didn't right. even know what we were doing until we got there. And we were almost like, yeah. maybe we'll do nothing. I don't know. Yeah, I'd be fine with that. Yeah. Rachel, it's not necessarily a let's just go somewhere and figure it out when we get there kind of person. She likes to know what's going on. I see. But, you know, if it's a cabin like that, I mean, that sounds pretty great. Yeah. Like that's, we honeymooned at a place that was kind of like that. We went to Colorado for our honeymoon mm-hmm. and it was like, one of those big A-frame Well, things. I mean, y'all are both cool. turning 40 around the same time. You could do a nice joint we are. Know, excursion. Yeah, we kind of talked about that. We're like, should we do something? Or yeah. like, I don't know. Let's I take guess. a weekend trip somewhere. It doesn't need to be far. Like you said, Virginia, yeah. like you've got a beach or mountains, whatever you want. Yeah, we'll have to do something. Yeah. We'll figure it out. I'll let you know what we do whenever we do it. Um, well, I had a fairly eventful weekend myself as well. Um, we had Rachel's parents come into town. So my in-laws were visiting. Um, which is great. I'm on, I've got a great relationship with them and you know, they're, they were supposed to come down like a month ago or so and we were sick and all this kind of stuff. So like it's been since basically since Christmas, since we've been able to see them. So it was really nice to be able to do that. Cause they're only a hundred miles away from us, but wow. Has it really been that yeah. long? Yeah. Yeah. Jeez. Yeah. Rachel's sister came down and saw us like end of January, something like that. But yeah, we've just had a lot of conflicts and illnesses and stuff that have kept Oh, from... maybe that's why. I yeah, feel like... we had a lot planned. But, oh, okay. Maybe you know. that's what I heard. Yeah. Um, so that was cool. And, uh, you know, it's nice because my father-in-law likes to do stuff when he mm-hmm. comes and visits. So I'm like, well, I got plenty of stuff to do. Um, so likes woodworking and stuff like that. So he helped me make progress on my... Uh, pedestal stand thing for the washer and dryer oh, that right. I've been working on for like months. Are you doing drawers in that thing or is it just going to be like a whole storage hole? It's, I'm not doing drawers like for baskets. the onset. I'm going to do like laundry baskets yeah, underneath. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so we can throw like shoes and stuff like that in That's there. right. You know, I was thinking about doing like drawers with slides and stuff like that, but. It'd be harder to clean under there. It's hard to clean. And then also if I wanted to like get stuff out of there. Like it's a very small mud room and it's like in between our kitchen and our garage. Yeah. So there's like lots of traffic through there too. So it would, everything would get all bunched up in there. And now you so. just take the baskets out and just vacuum under there. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It'll be easy to, easy to access and everything. So we basically have the pedestals built. Um, I'll try to see if I can show a picture for everybody, but um, not that it's that exciting yet, but you know, like that's the stand. So it's going to have, you know, oh, a couple of nice. things and it's going to have a top on it. So what and, kind of wood is that? Oh, it's just two by fours and oh, okay. plywood. Oh, okay. I'm going to paint it. So I was like, I don't care what wood this is made of. But, you know, I did like half lap joints, you know, which is where you basically take a piece of wood and you like cut half of it away, mm-hmm. you know, on the both ends that are meant to join. Mm-hmm. So you get lots of good surface area for like glue contact. Nice. So it's a lot more math. And it's a lot more planning to do it that way. Um, but it's going to be stronger in the end. And I was like, there's going to be a washer and dryer on top of this. They're going to be filled with like wet clothes. Yeah. that's going to be spinning around. Like there's a lot of weight, a lot of like, you know, forces at play there. So I'm going to make this thing really sturdy. Uh, so I feel really good about how sturdy it is. But it definitely take takes a lot of extra planning and stuff to make that happen. Did you already have all that wood? Did you need to buy it? I already had all of it. Yep. I, I figured you would. I just keep yeah. lots of two by fours and plywood on hand at all times That's for just awesome. such an occasion. Even all the screws, I already had them all. So, mm-hmm. yeah. 
though I do need to restock. That's what I do is I keep like whatever screws I'm using. I was using like two and a half inch wood screws, you know, number 10 size. So I was like, yep, got a bunch of those, used three quarters of them on this project. And it's like, all right, add it to my little Home Depot list. And the next time I'm at the store, I'll just pick up more and just have them ready to go for the next project. So, it seems like the hardest part's done. It, uh, yeah, the most, for the most part. Um, so it's weird because like, it's gonna be basically like wall to wall. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the width of this little mudroom is basically the size of the washer and dryer. Um, so I need to build this thing to be able to just kind of plop it in. But because of the size of the room and the shape it is, I, I can't just move it and put it in place. I have to actually build it in two pieces. So I can take one half of it, put it down and take the other half and put it down. Because if it was one piece, it's sort of like if you have a bookcase that's exactly the height of the ceiling. If you try to stand it up in the room, you won't be able to. I have that kind of effect. Yeah. So is on. there or is there going to be a gap, or are you going to put something over top of the two once they're sandwiched together? I'm gonna I'm gonna put like a giant piece of plywood over top of the okay. whole thing. So no gap. At, no gap. There will at be all. a gap in the legs, but not in the surface. Correct. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So it'll so be how are you going nice to like lift up the machines to get these things under? That's a great question. All right. Haven't figured that out yet. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Ellie? Um, yeah, actually, I mean, I've got a variety of different ways that I can lift things. So Snatch blocks. I'm not worried about it. <laughs> Snatch blocks could be involved. <laughs> well, it's interesting because it's like in a finished space. So I'm like, oh, man, I can think of a thousand if, different if ways to lift had something access up. To these ceiling joists. I know. I've got like, <laughs> I've got Snatch blocks. I actually have, I actually have a lift hoist in my garage, but. I don't have anything to like attach it to, mm -hmm. you know? So I don't actually 100% know how I'm going to lift up the have, have, you, have you seen those really but cool things? Case, you, I can horse them up there. Have I'm you seen those like beast. things you can like, like put on your shoulders to like lift up appliances like super easily? Yeah, there's like the, oh, what are they called? Um, there's a name for them. They're like straps that go around your arms yeah. and allow you to lift up. My brother brought some of those yeah. last time I moved Forearm there. Forearm forklift, yes. that's what it's called. They are amazing. I have some of those. They work. Okay. Yeah. I have some of those, but I've never used them because I've never had a willing participant. It makes you feel like you have superpowers. Okay. Well, like, then that might be how we do it. It's kind of wild. I think me and Ellie will probably end up doing it. Or maybe yeah, I'll throw you, one kid on each of if the you other. Can, if you can do the forearm <laughs> forklift part and Ellie yeah. can just shove the thing under. Yeah. Like. No, I would need her to be the other half of the forklift. Like, yeah. you need two people on, like, yeah, one person on would. each side of the thing. Yeah, I mean, all... But she's kind of a beast. She all she needs to do is just stand up. Yeah. And the four and four clips do the rest. Might be able to do it. The the washing, or the uh, dryer, I feel like I could just lift up there myself. Because yeah, it's only 18 inches off the ground. Yeah. But the washing machine, that's a little heavier. Yeah. But I yeah, She's going to get that thing on, things. she's going to be like, oh my gosh, I need to go lift some more stuff. What else can we pick up? I... Nothing Great. Can, nothing can stop me with these. I mean, I've always <laughs> wanted... I bought these things, like probably a decade ago yeah. and I don't think I've ever used them yeah. because I've never had another willing person to help me. Or it's like back in the day it was like my dad helping me and he and I could just like lift up a bookcase or whatever, yeah. you know, but I want to give that a try. I will report back yeah. once I do that. Um, so that was cool. Um, it was also a gorgeous weekend. So wanted to spend a lot of time outside. Um, and all right, yeah, our grass is growing in like full force already. It was like just soon as March hit, I was like, oh, like the lawn needs to be mowed already. Yeah. So that's like a thing now. I mean, I think I got maybe three months off of not having to mow. Like it feels like I just stopped at the end of November, but we've had such a temperate winter, which is funny because at the beginning of the season, they were calling for like all this like record setting snow around here. I heard that like, too. That did not happen yeah, nope. at all. So that's okay. Weather's hard to predict. Um, so I started doing that, which Joe's just really excited, which I'm like, darn it. Because he can make some money. Yeah, because he can make money. Yeah. And Ellie wants to make money now too. She oh was boy. like, so that was- Are you going to let her do it this year? <sighs> She's 12. Like, and it's, I've got a zero turn with like a three blade deck. Like it's yeah. a, it's a 900 pound machine. Well, is it, is it a physical thing or a mental thing? Um, it's a mental thing. Yeah. Physically, she's very capable of running the yeah. machine, but it's just having the wherewithal to drive a bladed machine around, you know, you can, you and can. Joseph has a fair dose of like worry, concern, and trepidation. He's very cautious. That I think helps with this scenario. Yeah. Ellie doesn't seem to have that exact same. Yeah. She also does not at all like to hear ever that she can't do something or well, that she shouldn't do I, something or that her would, brother gets to do something well, that she doesn't. It's not a lie to say <laughs> that, well, hey, you know what, Ellie, I still like to do it sometimes. So so that I can still do it sometimes, I'm going to find something else for you to oh, yeah. do. I don't even think, I think if, 
I think if I let her do it and she actually had to mow the lawn, she'd not be that into it because you get really dirty and gross. Oh. And like, especially in the summertime, it gets really dusty yeah. and you just get like covered in dirt and then you have to shower and all that. And she's got like really thick curly hair. Oh, so yeah. it would get all in her hair. It probably takes a day to dry that. Yeah, it'd be gross. So I think she just wants to earn the money. I don't think she wants to actually There's gotta mow. be something else kind of so, comparable. Well, so that was the thing. It turned into a whole conversation oh. about how she can earn money. Yeah, so like, she is my car washer helper. Ah, there so, you go. All of our cars were gross because I have not washed them the entire winter. And my car is black and Rachel's is blue. So they show dirt. So I was like, all right, Ellie. And normally we wash them together. Like she rinses, I scrub kind mm -hmm. of thing. I was like, you know, I'll pay you more if you want to wash and scrub, like do the whole thing. So she was all about that. There we go. So she wanted to wash every car. Of course. All four of them because... We have Rachel's car, my car, I have a truck as well, and then Rachel's parents' car. Oh, okay. So she was just like, yeah. She's like, well, we have everything out. I wanna wash everything I can. Of course. And I paid her more for the truck because the truck is big. It's a lot of surface area to wash. So she did all of it. Did she ask to wash the tractor too? She didn't say anything about the tractor, <laughs> no. But I'm sure if I'd offered, she would have helped. Actually, it doesn't, it's really gross, but. I mean, what, um, isn't it kind of like a, yeah, I don't wash it very often because yeah. it's just going to get covered in mud again. Um, that's when it's happiest, yes, uh, honestly. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, she washed four it vehicles. It feelings, Brian. Yeah, it took her like four, four and a half hours. And she just did it. She like took a break for lunch and that was it. And she just went. And I was like, this girl's got my work ethic. Joseph, I was trying to ask him about even just like aerating the lawn, which is you just drive around with a little pull behind thing. Mm. And no, I'm okay. All right, buddy. Ellie's out there like hustling, you know, doing yep. the thing. I was like, all right, there you go. That's, that's my two kids. So yeah, Ellie washed four vehicles on Saturday. Goodness gracious. Now she's got money. She's a force. She is a force. I'm just trying to teach her to use her powers for good. That's it. Um, but yeah, so I did aerate my yard, um, which is fun because it leaves little dirt turds everywhere. Yeah, the, the yeah. plug. You can do a spike aerator, which just like pokes holes in the ground mm -hmm. or you can use a plug aerator which is b better form of aeration yeah it terrifies so, me because i already have a yard full of dog poop so whenever they do that in my yard i'm like oh, oh my god oh wait no i'm okay oh yeah yeah instantly i, I just imagine like oh man, right. we really need to go out here and scoop oh but then, yeah but then i'm like oh never mind yeah it breaks this down is, this is dirt turds yeah dirt turds yep so now there are dirt turds all over the yard great yep that's fun so got to do that um, and that's always a good time. Oh, yeah, I know you often speak about how in your property, seeing deer is a very, very common occurrence. Absolutely, every um, day almost. When we were driving up the mountains, we passed some deer and Archer exclaimed, I've never seen a live deer before. Wow. So that just shows you how different our neighborhoods are. Okay, there you go. <laughs> I did not know he'd never seen a deer. I was like, wow. really? He's like, like in yeah, real life. where would I see one? And I was like, oh, well, okay. They're definitely around. Yeah, oh yeah. yeah. But uh, yeah. So, well, there you go. There you go. He needs to hang out with us more. I guess so. You'll see plenty of deer. <laughs> um, yeah. And then I had kind of an impulsive purchase. <gasps> Yay! A nostalgic <gasps> purchase. I just, I had no justification for buying this thing, but. You remember I bought a Pizza Hut lamp last week. Yes. Yeah, this is a safe place. It was place. less, but that was, I mean. This is a safe place for you, Brian. That was somewhat impulsive, but you've been, you've been playing I that have. for a while. I have. This was purely impulsive. Okay. Like I saw it at the store and I just went for it. I didn't even ask Rachel about it. I told her about it afterwards and I was like, I feel kind of ashamed that I bought this thing because oh it's gosh. so pointless. My interest is peaked. Oh, you will like this thing when I tell you what it is. So um, it was a toy. I bought myself a toy. Yes. Uh, I bought the Lego Optimus Prime. <gasps> oh my God. Joe has one of those. He brought it in. Yeah. I got to see it transform. It is epic. It's amazing. Oh yeah. I'm like six out of 10 bags in on oh. building it. And I'm building it together with Joseph. Oh, that's And it's got amazing. like, the book is like bound, you know, it's oh, like yeah. a thick book and it's got like facts in there. And I told Joseph, I was like, we're gonna savor the build. Cause he's yeah. like, wants to tear through it. I'm like, the build is the part of the experience. So him and I are building it together and all that kind of stuff. So it's like a kind of a bond thing that we get to do together. Nice. But it's pretty, it's pretty epic. Like I just really appreciate the detail and the engineering. And you know me, like I was always into like the transforming toys, 
Transformers was like a little bit ahead of our time because I think it came out in 84. Well, the Transformers- It was still it, around. It start, yeah, it started early, but they never really left the toy stores. Like, yeah, it was always, yeah. They were always there. But I didn't have a lot of Transformer toys. Like I didn't get a lot of the, like the mainstream toys. Ninja Turtles was more my thing. I, I, had I did. Ninja I, had, I had the original Optimus Prime. Oh, see, that's cool. See, I don't, yeah. I don't remember- He was ever. metal. Really? Mm -hmm. Wow. I don't remember ever having any actual Transformer toys myself. Like by the time I was getting into that stuff, I was into like Lego and Kinects and stuff like that. I had a couple kind of big Transformers and then I had a lot of little ones. Okay. Yeah, like yeah. the little tiny, like almost kind of hot yeah. wheel size ones. Yeah, I remember having some things like that. Yeah. Or like, remember I had a, a Ninja Turtle Donatello. Mm -hmm. Transformed into a race car. Like, yeah. I remember yep. that one. I, I loved that thing. Yeah. Oh, I just always was into like the, the great transforming, thing, transforming toys. And that that is still like, you know, uh, having, you know, been in the, toy, in the toy section of Target for the last, you know, 10 years, as oh, yeah. you have mm -hmm. um, with kids, you see only a few toy consistencies, you know, that mm. don't come and go and come and go. Even Ninja Turtles haven't always been there. Yeah. Um, sure. There have been gaps in between Ninja Turtle, you know, I, you know, intellectual property versions, but things that have always been there have been Ninja Turtles, sorry, uh, Transformers. Hmm. And for whatever reason, ever since Cars came out, there have been like- Still around, huh? Cars, Hot Wheels or whatever. Wow. Like Hot Wheels have always been there too. So Hot Wheels and Transformers, yeah, I true, guess. True, true. Um, but uh, G.I. Joe, no longer a thing. Hmm. Star Wars toys, kind of like the action figures yeah, been come and go. Yeah. Um, they're not like, there's no consistent series mm. though. Yeah. But Transformers, like the hmm. cool thing about them is no matter what, they're, they're always fun to play with, even if you don't have another one to play with. Yeah. With like, you know, Archer will go and say, hey, I want this Sonic the Hedgehog. I'm like, okay, fine. And he'll take it home and be like, yeah, there's nothing to do with it because yeah, you don't you have all the other, the other ones. Yeah. But with Transformers, you don't need another one. You, yeah. can, you can just have the Self -contained. one. Self-contained. But if you do have another one, then there you go. You Even got a storyline. So it's the perfect toy. Yeah. Yep. But I mean, other than a Lego one that does transforming and you can put it together. Yeah. It's pretty It's pretty epic. Um, definitely enjoying the build. Uh, not done with it yet, but it's... I appreciate it. It feels very solid. Oh, like, yeah. Just, I can appreciate that. I'm normally Lego Technic, so I don't buy a lot of regular, just conventional Lego mm -hmm. sets. That's more Joseph's thing. But he's he's seen my Technic builds that I have because we've got like some built-in cabinets and they're kind of up above the cabinet in our bedroom, which Rachel loves just having Legos looming over. I bet she does. That, um, but I have nowhere else to put them. Uh, so Joseph is excited. He's like, hey, this summer, can we like, take those apart and rebuild the B set or whatever. Cause Technic, you can usually build an A and a B set. And I'm like, yeah, that sounds awesome. I would love to do that. Especially get to do it together. Yeah. That's I, I thought I would look forward to it. And then, you know, I had a kid break apart my Ghostbusters Ecto-1 and I'm like, that's fine. I can just rebuild it. It has been months. Really? And I'm still sorting. I had four like ha uh, Halloween McDonald's buckets full of all my white parts, all my mm -hmm. black parts, mm -hmm. all my gray parts. And then I'm like, I don't even know what to do. If it asks for a white part, I just have this bucket of white parts. Mm. So I bought a bunch of little Dixie cups. And I've been sorting parts into these things because yeah. you know I'm not, I don't have bags anymore. I don't have bag right. one, bag two. It's just right. like, where do we even begin? Everything's all mixed up together. So yeah. I have probably 40 little tiny Dixie cups yep. and that still doesn't fill them all up. Wow. I have two muffin trays, 40 Dixie cups <laughs> and the four yeah. Halloween buckets. And I still haven't even begun to actually put it together. Yes. Like, I, So it really got broken that much? You had to like completely take the thing apart looking back i might have been able to salvage it but yeah. i picked the thing up and it was wobbly ah. and so i didn't really i couldn't see what was uh, broken like yeah. I, you know everything that was exteriorly broken yeah i was able to snap back together but the thing still kind of like you creaked it and wasn't, it wasn't something solid. in its core yeah oh. frame damage i guess yeah um so yeah i, I the car was totaled yeah yeah so i could have wow i could have managed it but then like if you only if you go back to kind of like you know step seventeen or something, you don't know what you've done or what's right. there. What yeah. if what if a piece did fall off while you were taking it? So I yeah, you kind of have to start zero. over. Yeah. yeah, so I'm like I'm. But now you get to build it again, all I'd over again. Yeah, I'm, I'm eager to build it, but yeah, it's going to take twice as long just to find all the parts. It does take longer. Yeah. yeah, but it gets better as you go because every piece you put on is one more piece you don't have to sort through yeah. to find the rest. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah I've done that with the the Technic ones especially because it's like you know some of the pieces can look very, very similar to each other. Yeah, this is like over a thousand and pieces too. Yeah, that's 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 it's gonna be a I think it's I gonna be know. an event, but yeah. it's all right. It'll be good to get it back together. 
Um, and then the last thing, yeah, I've been, I mean, I've been play, playing more saxophone, keeping up with that, mm. having a good time. Um, and then I'm at, uh, let's see here, where am I at right now with my amount of time? I feel like I need to report it now. It helps my accountability to you all, I guess. Um, not that I need that because really it's Rachel is the one I'm accountable to. Um, I have uh, 66 and a half hours. Out of? Until, out of 100. Out of 100. 66 and a half hours. You're over the hump. Until, no, I'm, that's how many I've left oh, to, okay. to, to do until I can consider the berry. Okay, so, well, you're almost halfway. Whatever that, I, the way I set up my spreadsheet, it has the countdown. It doesn't have a count up. I <laughs> so, see, I see. Because <laughs> that's all I care about. Gotcha. How much longer do all I have right. to You'll play? be halfway so before it's, it's, you know it. I'm a third the way through. I'm at like mid to late June at this point. Okay. That's my, as if I keep on track, so we will see. Um, I think that's a great 40th birthday present to yourself. Well, that would kind little, of fall late, nicely but, in there. You know. Yeah, well, that's, that's all right. We're, we're getting there. But um, last but not least, um, I mentioned how I bought Mud Runners yes. and Snow Runners. Oh, you got them both? I got them both. Oh, okay. They're pretty cheap. Steam Deck games are pretty nice. cheap. Um, so I, I played Snow Runners for the first time mm -hmm. this weekend. And it came out after Mud Runners, so it's like a newer game, so it's yeah. a little nicer. Um, and I like it. It's it's cool. Didn't you but, say you, you got stuck on the last one? Yes. Did you ever jump in to try to get unstuck? Or you just no, I haven't played that one again. You just, it's dead to <laughs> you now? I was just frustrated. <laughs> Well, now I know I can recover, you know, so some of it is like, I just have to learn the game a little bit. And it's weird because it's like on the Steam Deck, but it was originally a Microsoft game, I think for Xbox. So all the buttons are wrong. All the buttons are different. Yeah. And it's like a, a Steam Deck playable, you know, it's not like the Steam Deck verified. Mm. So it's like, there's some quirks with it. And so I was, I hooked the game up. I had the Steam Deck playing on the TV and I was using a Nintendo Switch controller to try to play it. So I was trying to show my father-in-law but I hadn't played Snow Runners. I fired it up, and they're just flat out like I did not know how to turn my headlights on. Like the dust dusk came, and I'm trying to drive my truck around, and it gets dark, and I'm trying every combination of buttons. I go into the settings, and all the settings are like keyboard commands. Aww. So I'm like, oh well, that's not helpful. <laughs> so did I could ever figure it out. I could have googled it or whatever. I have not figured it out on the Switch oh, controller, man. but now if I play it handheld, I can do it. So I just play oh, it handheld now. All right. So you know, but it's fun. It's a cool game. I just you know, it's just one of those games. It's kind of like how you've described what was it? I think like Red Dead Redemption, maybe, mm -hmm. where you're just like, you, you're not rushing. You just oh, no. are going slow through it. Like that's exactly how this is. Yeah. Like you are literally driving in like four-wheel drive through mud and i look at the map and i'm like oh it shows there's a trail there and i'm like oh there's boulders blocking the trail yep so i have to go back and go all the way around yeah i i, I love okay. the consequences i think that that <laughs> adds to the realism like right now it feels very realistic yeah like right I'm now like, yeah. i'm playing a game called horizon you know forbidden west and you are a girl who fights and can sometimes uh ride giant mechanical beasts and i'm okay. riding this thing and you know, there's a tree, but it kind of like, you kind of move past the tree, you mm -hmm. know, and whatever, you know, you walk up to the thing, you hit a bunch of buttons and you'll get on top of it. You go to Red Dead Redemption, if you walk up to your horse and you push the wrong button and you end up punching your horse, you just slug the horse in the face and it runs away and you're kind of- Now you have no horse. Right. So like, <laughs> yep. and you're like, well, crap, I just hit the wrong button. Well, sorry, you punched the horse, sir. Yeah, no. You Now you deal with the consequences. Yep. And if you're riding through the woods and you hit a tree, your horse is going to die mm. because you just ran full speed into a tree, <laughs> a tree and broke the horse's neck. And right. a lot of times people play these games. They're like, well, that's not fair. I'm like, well, don't that's run into realistic. a tree. Yeah. Right. Right. So I don't know. Games like it's that. A, it's a different And it makes you pace. take your time. Yes. It makes you take your time exactly. because like, I'm not going to run. Full, I'll, I'll run full blast when I'm on the trail yeah. but not through the woods. Yeah. That's like in this game. So I'm like going through the mud or whatever. And I'm like, oh, I'm running out of fuel. Okay. Guess I just have to leave this vehicle here. <laughs> <laughs> so like you can repair a vehicle, you know, because so, it has damage. Can you bring fuel to the vehicle? You can, okay. but you got to get in a different truck. Right. And you got to go to the fuel station and get fuel, <laughs> then bring it to the other vehicle so you can fuel it up so that you can then drive it away. I'm like, this is exactly like real life, except you can like transport yourself to another vehicle, like, you know, teleporting, Yeah, which is not realistic. But, yeah. you know, I was exploring. One of my missions was like to find my garage or whatever, which the whole map is dark. So you have to drive on these trails that you don't know where they're going for it to like light up little bits of the path. So headlights are very important then. Well, I mean, dark as in like when you're looking at the map, like when you go into map view, oh, yeah. it just shows like black. Until you, you uncover see, like, it. Oh, there's a trail that goes into the black over here. So you're like, 
The mission is to find the garage. I have no idea where the garage is on this gigantic map. So you just have to like drive on random trails until you find the garage. Go forth into the black. Yes. So then you like drive through and then I'm like driving along and you know, might get stuck or like my vehicle tips over or whatever. And I'm like, oh, okay. And I can recover, but it takes me back to like the starting place. Ah. And I'm like, because you can only re repopulate in a garage. And I'm like, that's the whole point of what I'm doing, trying to look. But you know, it's a different pace of game. So I only play it when I just like am trying to chill that's, and do that. But that it's, is that it's is how pretty, I think. Pretty realistic. Yeah, yeah that is that is so, how I play games. Yeah, but different 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 pace than some of the other games. And then I watch Rachel playing her games where she's just like, boop, 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 I'm crafting a thing. And look, I'm oh, planting and it grows in five seconds and now I'm harvesting it. And I'm like, yeah, that's a lot easier. <laughs> that's not real life. But anyway. Uh, yeah, so that's been my weekend. It's been Fantastic. Fun. Yeah, good. Good restorative weekend for me. Doing plenty of stuff. Also not doing plenty of stuff. Those are the best. Yeah, all around good. And that's, I think, it for what's happening, right? Yeah. I think we're about done with this episode here, so we'll go ahead and wrap it up. I want to thank you all for watching. Please leave us some feedback. Let us know how we're doing. Ask us some questions. You can check out gulliapens.com for fountain pen ink paper and all that good stuff. And I got some fun facts, Drew, motivated by your 40th B-Day. Oh, 84 facts? I have a mixture of 40-year-old okay. facts and 1984 facts. Okay, good. I thought of both. Excellent. Um, so there's plenty that you could perhaps, you know, think negatively about getting older and hitting a milestone and turning 40, but I decided to look at some things that are things to be psyched about turning 40. All right. So um, I did not like go multiple sources deep to verify all these things. So look them up yourself if you want. At this point um, of the podcast, nobody cares about facts. Good. Okay. Um, so while we often hear that 26 is the magic age at which our brains finally decide to grow up once and for all, According to researchers at University College London's Institute of Cognitive Neuroscience, that's a mouthful, the brain's prefrontal cortex continues to evolve well into our 40s. So your brain's still not done developing yet, Drew. I, I feel like I developed some some cognition this morning, actually. There well, there yes. you go. It's happening. Over my Pop-Tarts. Yes. More is coming. Um, your attention span will reach its peak around age 43, according to 2015 research published in the journal Psychological Science. Well, that's interesting. Yes. So you got a couple years left and then Any development in that area would be, be beneficial. you know, yeah, noticeable. <laughs> yes. Um, a 2019 study published in the journal De Economist found that creativity can peak in your mid-50s. So late bloomers are a real thing. Case in point, Martha Stewart, Octavia Spencer, Ricky Gervais, and Samuel L. Jackson all got their big breaks over the age of 40. So How about go. that? Probably there Brian Cranston, too. Unless you count Malcolm in the Middle, I guess. I don't know how old he was when he did Malcolm in the Middle. I think he was a little younger. But I, I, I was would pretty say, close to that. Yeah. I don't know if that was a big break, though. Break, eh, Breaking yeah, Bad. He got pretty popular that. Yeah, okay. Breaking Bad was definitely his, his big thing, but he was pretty well known for, for Malcolm in the Middle. Um, he had really only done like comedic roles before Breaking Bad, though. Breaking Bad was his first like dramatic thing. Do you know what I heard? Uh, I know this is a deviation, but uh, Liam Neeson going to be in a new Naked Gun movie. <gasps> I love the Naked Gun Oh, movies. me too. Tremendous. Huh. But Liam Neeson, not a comedic actor, but neither was Leslie Nielsen at the time. Right. Leslie Nielsen was never a comedic actor. Not until, until Airplane. Gun. Well, yeah. he did Police Squad. Right. No. Uh, yeah, Airplane came first. I don't know. I never saw and Police Squad. Did, but It was like a six-episode TV show. It was, was that all? very short -lived. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, because... I, thought, I assumed it was longer than that. It's because it was, it was too dense for television. Oh. There were too many jokes packed in there. People couldn't, you know, in the age of like, you know, uh, binge watching and right. re-watching... It does great, yeah. But it was just too it was too smart for television, basically. So it got canceled. But then, yeah. So I don't know. Yeah. I'm kind of cautiously optimistic. That's really interesting. Yeah, Liam I'm, I'm open to it. Yeah, very cool. I will look forward to that. Leslie Nielsen was he was a special guy, though. Mm -hmm. um, one of the funny things about Leslie Nielsen, if you ever look up him, he was like super deadpan. Um, he has the same type of humor that like a lot of my extended family has because all my extended family is all like New England. Mm -hmm. And that's just a very dry, deadpan kind of humor. So maybe it just feels familiar to me. Um, but one of my favorite things I think you told me about originally was he would have this like very realistic sounding fart noise maker yep. that he would keep in his hands when he would do interviews. And that was his favorite thing was to like have perfectly timed fart noises. Brilliant. 
and just deadpan them through interviews and yep. make people crack. There's some great videos it's online. Really about good. That. He, was, he was quite skilled at it. Yeah. Didn't Brian K. buy some I, of those? I bought sandwich? some. You for bought him. some? Yeah, I gave one to him. Yeah. Um, and I could not get it right. It was not. It's a, it's, also, it takes you, practice. you need to have kind of like a you know, a fleshy wet palm yeah. in order to do it. To My, get the real I have I have a mm. thin, dry palm. So because okay. it, it's just a it's just a, like a little uh, bladder with a hole yeah. in it. And it's you, like a whoopee cushion sort of against you, your hand. It, yeah. it just blows air into your palm, yeah. but you need to position it properly so it kind of, you know it's yeah. kinda of like, you know, have you ever put like a straw in your armpit and Yeah. You know, so that's oh, I never did that. <laughs> good, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Just, you're you're blowing. There you go. Um, and then a 2015 study published in Psychological Science says that the ability to identify and understand other people's emotions is a cognitive skill that doesn't typically peak until you reach your 40s. Look so at me. Your emotional intelligence gets higher. All right. Yeah. So there you go. So nice. those are your fun 40s facts. They had, I a like it. they had a bunch more, but it was like, you're more likely to have a house. You're more likely to not be poor. And it's like, well, that's should make sense. I hope so. Because you've just worked longer. Yeah. But anyway, um, 1984 facts. Okay. You ready? Yes. So the interest rates for the year end Federal Reserve, which I'm sure is like the number one thing on your mind. I don't even know the interest rates for this year. Um, well, it was 10.75 back then. Is that a lot? Notably higher than oh, it is okay. now. So as high as it feels now, it was higher in 1984. Um, in fact, my parents, when they moved down to... Virginia. They moved down to Virginia from Connecticut. They had a house in Connecticut and they moved down in 1983. So it was a little before that. They moved down not too far before I was born. Uh, they said that the interest rates were 21% for mortgages in Connecticut. That's the environment that they were in when they sold their house. Oh, it took, wait. It took a year to sell. Oh, so that's the same like mortgage interest rate. Mortgages are usually a little bit higher than the Federal Reserve. Oh, okay. Interest so, I mean, rate. like, I know my mortgage interest rate. Yeah. I the Federal yeah. Reserve interest rate. Federal Reserve is usually, a, you know, one or two percentages lower than that. Oh, uh, okay. Cool. Yeah. It's a, the two are very inextricably tied. Ah. But it's just like, that's the, it's the rate that the Federal Reserve loans money to banks. So then banks, when they loan it out for mortgages or whatever else, oh. it's going to be at least above that. That's a shockingly simple way to put something I thought was. Yeah. Very complicated. Thank you. It gets much more complicated than that. But, you know, basically, if the Federal Reserve raises the interest rate, borrowing money gets more expensive overall. So, yeah. There you go. Fun fact. Uh, the medium price of an existing home in 1984 was $72,000. Okay. It's a little different now. Yep. Uh, I think in Richmond, it's like 384000 or something like that now. So, noticeably higher. Um, the average income per year in 1984, this is all U.S. facts, um, $21,600. Wow. So, yeah, a little lower. A lot of this is because inflation has happened over the last 40 years, too. Uh, the movie ticket, average movie ticket price was $2.50. Oh, my God. So, yeah. But, again, you only made $21,000 a year on average. So We're going to see Ghostbusters this one. weekend. Are you? Which is crazy. because Which one? The only one that the is called Fro No, no, no. The new one. Oh, the new one. Yeah, oh, Frozen okay. Empire, which is crazy because oh. exactly 40 years later. There you go. Isn't that great? Probably not a coincidence. Yeah. Well, fun fact. I think that- To sorry. your fun fact, mm -hmm. Ghostbusters and Dune both came out in 1984. Mm. Ghostbusters Afterlife and Dune, the new one, came out in 2021. Mm. And now Dune Part 2 and Ghostbusters Frozen Empire coming out in 2024 as nice. well. Nice. Interesting. So- they both come out with sequels in 84, 2021, and 2024. I heard they're also re-releasing The Matrix in theaters because it's the 25th anniversary of The Matrix. Oh, my God. That was the first DVD my family ever got. That's a solid pick. It was in that one with like the paper cover with the little clippy oh, yeah. thing on the side. Oh, yeah. yeah. Definitely. My dad bought some DVDs pretty early on, but he didn't make great choices. I, well, Under, I Under Siege was one of them. Ooh. Steven Seagal. I mean, if you're going to watch a Steven Seagal movie, that's really the only one you should watch. It's still terrible. It is. But, <laughs> dude. It can, get, it can be so much worse. Dude. <laughs> There's a whole YouTube channel called Worst Movie Ever, and they're um, only about Steven Seagal movies. That's pretty great. Or something like that. Yeah. I don't know. I've seen a bunch of them. They're god uh, One gallon of gas was $1.10. Oh, then. man. Yeah. Um, the space shuttle Discovery launched for its maiden flight in August of 1984. Nice. Yeah. I like an 84 space fact. Yeah. Which we may I go see that. They have the Discovery shuttle in the, um, I can't remember the name of the annex for the Air and Space Museum. That my, Rachel's parents live like 
10, 15 minutes from there. Oh, that's awesome. So we took the kids there when they were really young. Yeah. So I don't remember. So we're talking about, uh, you know, we got spring break coming up here or maybe this summer going up to DC and doing some museums and That'd stuff. That'd be cool. So yeah, we might take them in there and it's like, oh yeah, the spatial, it's huge. Have you ever seen it? It's it's way bigger than you would think. You look at it and you're like, oh, it's kind of like a plane, mm. but it's like five stories tall. The thing is huge. Jeez. Yeah, you feel very small next to that spatial. So you have to go to a different location, not the museum? Yeah, because it's not like in the city like yeah. of DC. It's, it's in Dulles technically. Okay. So it's sort of near the airport. Gotcha. Yeah, but it's cool. They have like an SR-71 in there. Mm. They have the Enola Gay, which is what dropped the bomb in Hiroshima. Oh. They have that there. They have a whole bunch of planes and stuff. It's really, Dang. really rad. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So anyway, because they have more room there, I guess yeah, they can put like more stuff sense. in there. Yeah. Um, where's the beef catchphrase was introduced in a Wendy's commercial um, by Clara Peller, who was 81 at the time. So um, fashions for 1984 included leggings, jean jackets, parachute pants, giant shoulder pads, short skirts and fluffy hair, and Madonna's head to toe lace look. That was in all 1984 stuff. Uh, Hulk Hogan took down the Iron Sheik and became the WWF champ for the first of six times. January 24th. Is that when that happened? Wow. That was when Hulkamania was born. Well, there you go. That was right around that time. You WrestleMania were, is also turning 40 this you year. In your final gestation at that period. Um, I'll be back became Arnold Schwarzenegger's catchphrase from the Terminator. Originally, it was, I will be back. Because it, he, they wanted it to sound robotic, but uh, he's oh. like, no, no, I can say I'll be back. He had very little English at the time. Right, right. Luckily, Michael Bean was there to inspire him with his that's acting really, chops. That's what history has proven. That Everybody really... remembers Michael Bean. When they think Terminator, they think Michael Bean. Of course, absolutely. Yeah. Um, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles were first introduced as a comic in 1984. That's right. Um, the top television shows were Dallas, uh, Dynasty, The Cosby Show, and 60 Minutes, and Family Ties. So that's what was happening. Transformers was 84 too. There you go. And then top, t yes, that's right. Top 10 grossing films of 1984. Hang on, hang on. Do you know them? Of course. Ghostbusters. That's on there. Uh, Amadeus. Um, No. Footloose. Footloose. Um, Beverly Hills Cop. Yep. Uh, Nightmare on Elm Street. Mm -hmm. um, Terminator. Uh, No. Karate Kid. Karate Kid. Um, let's see, uh, Red Dawn? Mm -mm. No. Um, let's see, Police Academy? Mm-hmm. Okay. Is that five? That's five. You got five of the ten. Oh, okay. Um, well, I don't need to do all ten. Gremlins? Gremlins. Okay. Yep, that's six. Um, let's see, uh, Spinal Tap? Mm-mm. No. That did come out then, but it wasn't okay. top grossing. Uh, let's see. Let's do, um, Never Ending Story. Mm-mm. Um, it did come out then, though. Mm-hmm. Which I uh, hates that movie. Yeah, no. I like it. <laughs> yeah. Romancing the Stone? Yes. Okay. That's seven out of ten. That's pretty um, solid. Let's go with, uh... You definitely Purple know. Rain? No. Okay. You definitely know at least one more of these, for sure. I said Ghostbusters, Karate Kid, uh... It's part of a franchise. Yeah, there were a lot of franchises starting right about that time. Um, this is the second movie of a franchise. Oh, Temple of Doom. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Um, and then there's another franchise that was the third movie of a franchise. Third. Mm-hmm. It's Conan the Destroyer, but that was the second one. Mm -mm. Okay, Not I didn't that. think that was top grossing. Nope. The third one. Oh, Star Trek, The Search for Spock. Yep. And there's one more. Okay. You've got nine out of 10. That's mm. very solid. <laughs> very solid. Oh, man. One more movie. This one's a little tougher. I don't know if you get this one. Muppets Take Manhattan. No. Ah. All right. Give it to me. Splash. Oh, of course. Tom that Morris was Hank's Morris. big break. David yeah. Morse, who played George Washington in the John mm. Adams miniseries, was supposed to play that role. Really? But declined. Tom Hanks came in, scooped wow. it up. And the world has never been the same. Wow. Did that come out before Big? Or yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. I thought Big was his breakout role. No. Splash. 
Oh, okay. He splashed. John Candy was in that too. I remember. Yeah. I remember seeing that movie as a kid and not having a clue what was going on. It was on. weird. I remember Especially seeing the that. end. I remember seeing that in Cocoon and I had no idea what was going on. I don't happening. remember Cocoon, but yeah, Splash was weird. It was okay. good, but weird. Ending was like bizarre. A lot, of, a lot of movies back then were He's weird. like went into the ocean. You're like, wait, what are you, what, are you going to get a tail now, yeah, bro? I don't especially know. as a kid, I was like, what's happening here? It's the 80s. Anyway. Well, there you go. Well, thank you for that. that was enjoyable. I love talking about 1984 movies. Would, that was delightful. I figured you would not hate that it. That made so. my day. There you go. That's all we got for you all this week. Uh, thanks for watching, and we'll see you on the next one. Right on.